Uh, good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. I hope everyone had a very nice break and wish you all a, a happy new year. Um, could everyone ensure that their mobile phones are switched to silent, please? Uh, and um, of course you can use them for um, social media, but not to photograph or record proceedings. The first item on our agenda is an evidence session on the draft budget 18-19. Uh, uh, the com committee's approach to scrutiny of the draft budget reflects the approach recommended by the Budget Process Review Group, uh, and this approach entails addressing budget implications throughout the year and bringing this information together to inform a pre-budget report for consideration by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we issued our pre-budget report on 13th of November, and the report set out some recurring themes and issues we identified in relation to the Scottish Government's draft budget. Uh, the timing of report uh, in advance of the publication of the draft budget was to enable the Scottish Government if it uh, chose to endorse our recommendations to implement uh, uh, then in the draft uh, to implement then in the draft budget a response to our report uh, was received by the Cab from the cabinet secretary on the 12th of december could i welcome to the committee uh, shona robinson cabinet secretary for health and sport um, and uh, Christine McLaughlin, Director uh, of Health Finance Scottish Government. We have apologies from Paul Gray, who is unable to join us today, and the committee also has apologies from Alison Johnson. Um, could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Okay, well, uh, thanks, Convener. Happy New Year to you and the committee. Um, I welcome the opportunity to give evidence this morning on the, the budget proposals for our National Health Service. As we start 2018, it's an important year as we look forward to the NHS turning 70 years old and we also look forward to Scotland's Year of Young People. And in this context, I'm grateful this morning to have the opportunity to discuss with you how we ensure that the NHS, our most treasured public service, is equipped to serve the people of Scotland both now and for the generations ahead. In terms of equipping the NHS through investment, this government has committed to increase the health resource budget by £2 billion by the end of this parliament. In 2018-19, we take a further step towards this, with the resource budget increasing by over £400 million, which is an uplift of 3.4%. We will continue to prioritise investment in frontline <coughs> services, and therefore, investment in our frontline NHS boards will increase uh, by 3.7% uh, or 2.2% in real terms. Convener, it's important to emphasise that this additional funding for our NHS is provided as part of our twin approach of investment and reform, recognising the increasing demand and expectations placed upon our frontline services and being clear that the status quo is not an option. It's through this approach that we'll see more care delivered in the community through primary and social care services and will deliver our triple aim of better care, better health and better value. As we equip the NHS through additional investment, this government recognises that the staff in our health and social care services do an outstanding job in caring for the people of Scotland. And we've seen that particularly over the last few weeks as they deal with winter pressures. And it is right in fulfilment of our programme for government uh, commitment that hardworking uh, NHS Scotland staff receive a pay settlement which acknowledges rising inflation. Our draft budget reiterates our commitment to this that will lift the 1% public sector pay cap and provide a guaranteed minimum pay increase of 3% for all public sector workers who earn up to £30,000. We'll also be mindful of any developments for NHS staff elsewhere in the UK to ensure that our health service staff are treated at least as fairly as those in any of the UK nations. Convener will make these commitments on investment at a time of significant financial challenge. Following the UK autumn budget, Scotland is facing a real terms reduction in our day-to-day -day budget of £200 million in 2018 19 and £500 million by 2019 20. However, in the face of these real terms reductions to our block grant, it is only possible to support our level of investment in the NHS without damaging other portfolios as a result of our proposals on tax. The draft budget sets out proposals designed to make our tax system fairer and to generate revenue in support, uh, to, in support of public services, including an NHS which remains true to its founding principles, free at the point of need and publicly owned and operated. A central component of the health and sport budget for 2018-19 is that it will allow for further progress in delivering our com commitment that more than half of frontline spend will be in community health services by the end of this parliament. The funding in 2018-19 is designed to support a further shift in the share of the frontline NHS budget dedicated to mental health and to primary community and social care. 
We're increasing the level of investment in mental health in CAMS. In 2018-19, a further £17 million will be invested, which will go towards the commitment to increase the workforce by an, an extra 800 workers over the next five years and the, for the transformation uh, in CAMS. I expect that this funding will be in addition to real terms increased spending on mental health services by NHS boards and integration authorities, which is already in excess of £1 billion per year in 17-18. Therefore, I expect that this budget will deliver an increase in mental health spend in excess of 3% and will support a shift in the balance of spending. Spending on primary care will be supported through the Primary Care Fund, increasing to £110 million in 2018-19. This will support the transformation of primary care by enabling the expansion of multidisciplinary teams for improved patient care and a strengthened and clarified role for GPs as expert medical generalists and clinical leaders in the community. This forms part of our commitment to increase funding for primary care by £500 million by the end of the Parliament. In terms of spend on social care, in 2018-19, an additional £66 million is in the, included in the local government settlement allocation to support additional expenditure by local government on social care in recognition of a range of pressures that they and integration authorities are facing, including support for the implementation of the Carer Scotland Act 2016, maintaining our joint commitment to the living wage, including our agreement to now extend it to cover sleepovers following the further work we've undertaken, and an increase in free personal and nursing care payments. A central part of our activity in 2018-19 will be a continued focus on our early intervention and prevention approach to public health, balanced by efforts to support everyone to lead healthier lives regardless of their circumstances. We're consulting on a new diet and obesity strategy and we're, in, we're progressing measures to limit the marketing of products high in fat, sugar and salt, which disproportionately contribute to ill health and obesity. Addressing the use and impact of drugs is a challenge that is not unique to Scotland, but it's one that we are determined to meet, and we've begun an overhaul of our drug strategy, guided by a principle of ensuring the best health outcomes for people who are or have been drug users. We'll expand its scope to set out a new vision for alcohol and drug treatment together. As set out in the programme for government, this renewed focus on alcohol and drugs will be backed by additional investment of £20 million in treatment and support services. Our vision is also of a Scotland where more people are more active more often and the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework sets out our ambitions for achieving that and is underpinned by a commitment to equality. Along with additional investment of £2 million, we'll underwrite the potential shortfall in funding of up to £3.4 million for Sports Scotland in 2018-19 and we'll continue to encourage the UK Government to take the appropriate action required to address lottery reductions. In Conclusion, convener, I'd like to conclude my opening uh, comments emphasising that this is a budget uh, to equip the NHS to serve the people of Scotland both now and for the years and generations ahead. I've set out again our twin approach of investment and reform, additional funding for health and sport, supporting fairness for all across society and delivering the reforms needed to equip our health and social care services for the years ahead, allowing people to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ivan, would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, convener, and thanks, Cabinet Secretary, for, uh, for coming along to talk to us this morning. Um, I'm, I, I want to cover off on a couple of issues around about the, the overall funding, but I think it's important at the start to make the point, obviously, that we, uh, we're talking here about inputs, but what's important ultimately at the end of the day is outcomes. And I know later in our discussion, we're, we're going to focus on performance in a bit more detail. So I'll leave that to one side and just focus, as I say, on the uh, on the inputs at the moment. And just for clarification and for the record, um, looking at the numbers, I can see there's a 373 million cash increase in the budget 2018-19 um, compared to the previous year. Um, and that translates into 175 million increase in real terms. So it's true to say that not only is there more cash going into the, the service, there's more um, uh, money going in in real terms as well. That, that's correct. Um, there is a, a real terms increase, um, and that's in recognition of the, the fact that investment is important. But I think, as I said in my opening remarks, that investment and that real terms investment has to go alongside reform, which I think is what you're you're pointing okay. towards in terms of outcomes. Um, and uh, those reforms need to make sure that every single 
the pound of that additional money and indeed the money that's already in the system is uh, delivering the most effective and efficient services and uh, the programme of reform we've laid out uh, over the last few months focusing um, on um, the drugs budget for example on how we um, look at elective capacity and deliver that more effectively and how we shift the balance of care to keep people out of hospital so so it's a really much a twin track approach and um, the the resources that will be generated um, to be able to be reinvested through reform are equally as important as the real terms increase in resources absolutely are and just just to clarify on that then because we, we tend to have a conversation about Efficiencies is a word when we, when we talk about health board spending, etc. Um, but in that context of a real terms, a real terms increase in the funding, when we're talking about efficiencies, we're not talking about it in the context of people spending less or spending less in real terms. We're really talking about it in the context of people reallocating money from one area of spend to another. Would that be a fair comment? Well, well that that's right. Um, and also looking to, to meet the increasing challenges. So although more money is going into the NHS um, in real terms, as I've said often, um, the demands upon our services continue to grow, uh, particularly the, the demographic challenges, which means that we need to do things differently. Right. And therefore, we're working very much with boards. Christine can give you more of the detail around how do we ensure that our services are working in the most effective way. So a lot of focus on regional working boards working together to, um, to do things differently. Uh, to use the capacity we've got in a different way, to, to look at elective capacity in a different way, uh, to make sure that uh, looking at the, the drugs budget, that there's a, a common approach to prescribing practice, for example, because you know there's variation there. Uh, and as the Chief Medical Officer has often said, um, the focus on, on um, addressing unwarranted variation so that all of our services are operating to the best and the resources that are then um, uh, used more effectively uh, are in addition, obviously, to the um, additional okay. investment that this budget would deliver. Okay. And just finally, um, j j again, just to, to clarify on the uh, the manifesto commits, there was manifesto commit to <coughs> increase the, the spend on the health service over the lifetime of the Parliament by two billion, and so far that's increased by 743 million, which looks to be on track given the, 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 the inflation impact going forward. That's um, not far off the 40% uh, the you'd expect after two years. And the real term commitment was to increase by 500 million in real terms. And uh, what we've seen so far is a 370 million increase over the first two years. So it looks like that's running far ahead of target. So as far as you're concerned, are you quite comfortable that those manifesto commitments are on target and will be met over the course of the five-year parliament? Yes, I am. And uh, this year's uh, budget is a very important contribution towards that in terms of that headline, uh, two billion commitment, but also in terms of us being able to shift the balance of care uh, as uh, we've laid out, I mean, uh, this is a, a really big step in that direction. Um, okay. to clarify, so ju just, just to clarify numbers, overall for the portfolio, there's an increase of over £400 million in cash in 1819. Um, so in terms of the, the £2 billion, it was still required to be um, additional funding in the latter years of the Parliament to meet that, but, but as you say, it is headed in the right direction. So the other two key targets about primary care mm -hmm. as, as a percent of frontline spend and about more than half of frontline NHS spend on community <coughs> health services. So we're seeing increases in those proportions, which is headed in the right direction. The important thing will be the, the pace at which those um, both of those measures increases over the next few years grows at a greater pace than it's at, and that's the importance of investing in reform. But certainly the, the information from our published data would suggest that we are headed in the right direction and there's, there's increases in both of those areas. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emma. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm interested in NRAC allocations. Um, I'm aware that uh, the, the National Resource Allocation Committee um, calculates funding based on age, geography, deprivation, so rurality, which is important for me as a South Scotland uh, MSP. But the NRAC funding is often it's not decided upon until other allocations are made. So I'm interested to know if, uh, if um, the Scottish Government is committed to NRAC and is it still considered to be the best way to um, allocate formulas? I'll ask Christine to comment on the detail in a second, but you know we have 
over the years and previous administrations also have had varying formulas that have applied and uh, by and large, I think it's fair to say they've all been criticised in one way or another. And, you know, the, the difficulty in any formula is that it has to be done over a longer period of time in terms of adjustments. Otherwise, you run the risk of destabilising uh, other boards as you make that transition. But it's fair to say that the NRA allocations that are planned for 2018-19 will bring all boards within, I think, it's 0 0.8%. 0 .8. So I think that's the closest we've been... Yeah. Certainly, for some time, to yeah, parity. Do you want to? Yeah. So I, I'm not. I maybe ask you just to, to give me a bit more detail on the first point of what you were saying, because I didn't quite understand. Yeah. In, in our briefing papers, it talks about how NRAC funding is calculated, but it's often based on um, uh, Scottish government makes various adjustments to the allocations before assessing progress towards NRAC. So I'm just curious as to how. How do we get parity with certain allocations across different boards? Um, so I, I, I would probably maybe need to go into that in a bit more detail, but just at, at a high level on, on NRAC, um, NRAC is the basis of all of the recurring funding to boards, so it is calculated as part of the of the budget um, and updated on a, an annual basis, so it isn't something that's an, an afterthought, if you like. Um, the The... We've always had an approach that said we didn't want to destabilise any board, which is why movement to parity is over a long period of time. Um, last year we were at no board was further than 1% from parity. Eight, uh, sorry, for 1718-1819, the extra funding moves us to zero, no board um, further than 0.8%. So that, that is the closest we've been to parity since NRAC was introduced. Um, that Eight boards will receive additional funding um, for the, being behind parity. Um, as a result of, that, of the £30 million pounds going in. Um, the, there is a component of our funding, which is maybe what you're talking about, that, that doesn't go out on NRAC, which is all of our programme spend. Mm -hmm. So things like funding for health visitors, for instance, is a, a large component of additional funding in the system, and that's been given out specifically to meet mm -hmm. the agreed increases in health visitor numbers in different parts of the country. Um, so I think one of the issues is, is the extent to which there is still some funding that doesn't sit within NRAC. It's also not a formula that applies and can apply to the eight national boards either because they're not um, population-based in their services. So I think to answer your question, there, there, there can and there are always um, opportunities of looking at different ways of funding the system. If you look at England with payment by results, I think they've now realised that in a system um, <coughs> under pressure, a, a, a volume-based um, funding system isn't always the, the right way to go. So I think we can all learn from, from each other. I think one thing that, would, that we've um, discussed looking at more in our system is the extent to which you can incentivise um, the performance and the outcomes that you're looking for rather than just the, 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 um, the population that you serve. Um, so I think we're always open to looking at that in, in more detail, particularly with health and social <coughs> care integration when you've got a, a different funding model for, for local government. So all I would say is that it, whenever you introduce a new funding mechanism, it takes quite a long time to do all the research to look at different options. Um, and then you, if you're not wanting to destabilise your system, it is a long lead-in time before you seek change. So it's not to say that we shouldn't look at it, but I think it would be quite a few years on probably before we would, we would introduce something that was markedly different from what we've got. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Um, Miles? Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning to uh, the panel. I wanted to um, touch on the area of capital budget. Um, the proposed um, Scottish Government budget um, looks to do a reduction of £70 million in the NHS capital budget. And given the backlog of repairs which we know already exist, I wondered if you'd like to comment on whether or not that was the best use of resource. Well, um, first of all, the important thing to say about capital budget is it fluctuates from year to year. And what we've seen... Uh, off the back of 1718 was the conclusion of a number of big capital projects. <clears throat> so, you know, capital budgets will reflect where you are in the cycle of, of capital uh, build. And, uh, you know, um, and I'm sure Christine will say a little bit more uh, about that. But within the priorities for capital uh, investment, um, we'll be obviously making sure that... Um, essential uh, repairs and maintenance are, are carried out and that the boards are supported to do that. But in addition to that, um, some 
Um, other priorities, for example, the Scottish Ambulance, Service Re Ambulance Replacement Programme, Radiotherapy Equipment Replacement, um, the NHS Highland Theatres Upgrade, the Electrical Upgrade at Nine Wells, um, among uh, some other local projects. But, Christine, do you want to say a little bit about why yeah. the capital budget fluctuates? So, um, you know, we've, we've, <coughs> we've had in, in December the opening of the Dumfries and Galloway um, New Royal Infirmary, which is a fantastic facility. That, that was one of the reasons why mm. our ca total capital... <coughs> budget in 17-18 was, was higher than going into 18-19 because that's now complete um, along with the, the, the Scottish National Blood Centre as well. So just for, for assurance about 18-19 the capital budget covers all of our planned commitments for 18-19 so there is nothing that we've had to pull back on um, in 18-19 so that, that reduction really reflects our planned spend. It covers what we expect to spend on the elective centres, um, initial work on the, the Beard and Anchor and, and the Balfour in Orkney. So all of those core programmes are covered. <coughs> um, every year we give approximately 150 million core funding to the NHS boards for maintenance and, um, and minor replacement. Um, and we expect that to stay at fairly static levels. Um, so back to your point about, about the level of maintenance in the system. So backlog maintenance has stayed fairly static for the last few years. So um, the latest figure was, was £887 million. Pounds. Um, general wisdom is that the best way to deal with backlog maintenance in a significant sense is by um, replacement and rationalisation of sites. And that's really been, been our approach. Um, for next year, approximately £60 million of, of funding that goes to boards will, will be to reduce backlog maintenance but as you'll appreciate as you deal with something like reducing backlog maintenance in Dumfries you then have an increase in, in backlog maintenance costs in nine wells because of the electrical issues which we're, um, we're investing in for next year so there will always be things that come off the list and then get, get added. Um, there are some fairly large potential investments um, coming up over the next five to ten years we've got initial business cases coming in for um, things like the uh, Monklands replacement in, in Lanarkshire um, an eye pavilion replacement in Lothian um, and potentially um, a case for a new South East um, Cancer Centre for in the Lothian area. So we'll be looking at as much 1819, but also looking ahead to the pipeline and see how we manage to um, build these into the overall infrastructure programme for Scottish Government. I wanted to, in, in terms of those projects, uh, <coughs> um, when will the government publish or actually undertake a strategic review of projects like this? As a Lothian MSP, I've been involved um, with the Edinburgh Cancer Centre, and there's £26 million pounds going um, towards the backlog of some of it very significant for that centre. But it's quite clear for the whole southeast of Scotland, the new centre's required. So in terms of that scoping work taking place and actually then prioritising projects across the country, um, how's the Scottish government working on that? And and when is that likely to be brought forward? So we are, well, one of the recommendations from the Audit Scotland report was um, development of a capital investment strategy, which is underway just now. Um, we, so what we said to board just now is we, we don't expect any cases to come forward to the capital investment group for consideration without having, as a minimum, um, being part of the regional um, plans for all areas. So, so we're not looking for individual board um, submissions now to help us with that prioritisation. Um, and we're just consulting with the system just now about setting up a national um, infrastructure board to allow us to prioritise nationally. So that would deal with precisely that issue that you raise. But I'm well aware of the situation and the balance between investing in, um, in maintenance of the existing cancer site versus um, investing in a new one. Partly that's timing and there's some, in, there's some work that we need to do just now that, that, that can't wait for a couple of years. So that's the, the balance and in, in, um, deciding to invest now for in the existing cancer services. Okay, thank you. Could I ask in relation to the um, NPD projects, um, the, or the papers we have say that the changes uh, mean that the, these can continue to be treated as private sector projects in terms of accounts and the operation in the way in which they're structured. So there's very little difference between NPD and PFI in that regard. Is that, would that be correct? Um, so I think what we're seeing is that we're, we've resolved the accounting issues for the NPD, but the, um, the main difference in the way the NPDs are structured is, is that I think there's, there's um, a mechanism to deal with um, generation of profits mm -hmm. and how that fund is resolved. So it feels like the, the, risk sh the level of risk and the balance of risk um, is more where we would want it to be with, with the NPD 
projects that we have in place. Do you think we need to change the name of it? Because non-profit mm. distributing would suggest that there is no profit to be distributed yeah. when, in fact, there's very significant profit to be distributed. So do you think it's a misleading name? Um, to, well, to I mean, they're, they're now classed as publicly owned and therefore require capital funding. And, you know, you'll know the history of, obviously, the position that the ONS has taken. Um, I mean, I think it probably is helpful to, you know, track back wh which projects were funded through which pipelines and therefore we wouldn't yeah. be intending to, I'm not, to change I'm not, the I'm definition. I'm not disputing that, but, you know, if you said to somebody, we have a project in which there's a non-profit distributing uh, system, they would say, oh, well, there's no profit to be distributed, when actually that's far from the case. I think, I think people are generally confused just right, probably by names of PFI and PPB and, and, and NPD. Yep. Um, I think looking back, what might be helpful for us to do, particularly now that we've got <coughs> some fairly substantial NPD projects, is to look at the way in which they are operating compared to some of our earlier um, PFI deals, because we're always looking to try to get that balance um, feeling like it's in the, the, the best interests of all parties involved. Absolutely. I think it's fair to say that a lot of progress has been made from the earlier PFI projects, despite what you're saying, Camina, I think the the levels of <clears throat> the, the poor deals that were struck in the early days are some that we're still paying for, unfortunately, in, in great numbers. And of uh, I, I can't remember what the, the current figure is that we're paying out for P PFI. I, I but, haven't got the, the but it's substantial. Figure. What I would say as well is that part of some of the work we've done this year is further <coughs> reviews of the earlier PFIs. Mm. Um, and we've generated almost another um, mil um, million pounds just from looking at the annual contract values. Mm -hmm. So there's still more to go at, particularly with, as you see, mm -hmm. the earlier yeah. PFIs. Um, you'll be aware we're looking at things like whenever there's opportunities <coughs> to um, buy out things like domestic services, as we did in the, the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So I think we always need to keep a really close eye on these deals. I think the NPD deals do seem to be structured um, in a way that, that does feel more appropriate. But yes, it does involve private sector funding and um, I don't think we're seeking to hide that. No. And I think there's maybe some more detailed work needs <coughs> done in that to assess whether they are as good value as people portray them to be. Um, Alex. Uh, thank you, convener. For the first time, um, the money for social care is being paid directly to local authorities rather than going through the convoluted route of the health service. Um, I wonder, given the presumption against ring fencing, how are we going to keep tabs on this money, particularly when this budget covers the 3% uplift in the health uh, service, but the wider budget doesn't cover the 3% uplift in local authorities. It was almost a flat cash settlement for local authorities. Um, how will we stop local authorities seeing this as uh, an easy way to meet some of their 3% obligations outside of the social care workforce and make sure that this is spent on social care? So if, if I could just say, first of all, that um, the £66 million pounds that's got to be seen uh, in addition to the £550 million pounds that is already in the system that has essentially been a, uh, resources that have uh, passed through the, the health budget to support uh, social care, and that is now recurring money uh, within the system, so over half a billion pounds. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to see against that backdrop uh, of substantial resource. Uh, what we have uh, discussed with uh, with uh, COSLA, uh, local government, um, is uh, the priorities around that 66 million pounds they laid out in my opening remarks uh, to cover um, commitments such as the, the, the carers uh, legislation. Uh, the living wage, including uh, sleepover, uh, and the uh, uprate to free personal and nursing uh, care. Uh, and uh, I think there's a, I guess in short answer would be that there's a common uh, commitment um, to those priorities. Um, local government has agreed with us that paying and maintaining the living wage to uh, social care staff is an important part of recruitment and retention. Therefore, it's not in their interest to not do that. So, um, you know, it is a, a common commitment and common interest to make sure that those priorities are delivered. And, you know, we, uh, you're right, we don't ring fence uh, uh, as such, but what we do is we have very clear agreements that that uh, is the, the focus and purpose of those resources. And we're not, we have no indication from COSLA or any individual local uh, authorities that they don't share those uh, uh, joint priorities for the delivery of uh, of that money. And is there a process for monitoring 
um, that sort of adherence <coughs> to those collectively agreed priorities and for pulling in local authorities that perhaps aren't spending the money as they should be? So, I mean, we do that through well, regular meetings uh, uh, with COSLA and I also meet very regularly with local partnerships. It tends to be with not just the local authority, but the chief uh, officer of the Integrated Joint Board, uh, often the NHS chief exec as well. So we tend to, to meet on a partnership basis. So we would uh, continue to do that. Um, plus, we have the Ministerial Strategic Group that uh, I chair jointly with uh, COSLA to, that oversees the delivery, if you like, of, of integration priorities. Um, you know, so we uh, would, uh, I think we'd pick up quite quickly if there was a, uh, a local authority that for whatever reason wasn't going to deliver, for example, maintaining the, the living wage. I just don't think, though, it would be in their interest to do that. Why would you invest in the living wage to date and then suddenly not? Uh, why would you not address the, the issue that we've all been working on to address the issue of sleepovers, for example? It would be counterproductive for any local authority to not do that. So, I mean, it's a mature relationship and uh, one that is based on these jointly agreed uh, priorities and that, you know, but we would pick up, and Christine, you meet very regularly with your financial colleagues yeah. within local government, and you would get a sense if there was any issue with that. Yeah, if I can maybe pick that up in relation to the report that you produced in, in December. on There's a lot in that, obviously, on, on transparency, and there's a number of measures that, that we um, have, <coughs> have kicked off to introduce to make that easier to understand and to get that kind of information about um, spend and planned spend. So... Um, from, from February, we've agreed with integration authorities to start a consolidated reporting on, um, on spend. And, and as part of the budget, we'll be looking to gather that information on the, the plan spend on all of those key areas. As, I, mean, I know that you've um, used ADPs as an example about getting better transparency about the spend. I mean, we all want to see what the outcomes are too, but, but trying to get better understanding on things like mental health spend, primary care, community. So, so that's something that would also allow us to see very clearly whether social care spend is going up, down or staying the same um, and gives us an easier way in to start to look at that and understand why that might be the case. Some kind, in some cases, there might be some genuine reason. So there might have been a one-off investment in one year um, that is therefore not included in the next year. I think the approach that we're taking for next year just allows that bit of flexibility for the system to, to calibrate. And if it doesn't, then we would seek to understand why that was and whether there was any intervention that felt appropriate. <coughs> thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, Sandra, yeah, go. Thank, thank you, convener. If I could just come up, uh, come in uh, on that particular point, when you mentioned about, um, you know, you were in February, basically, you were pre I don't know if you'll be producing the report or you'll be looking at it then, because that was a, a concern of the committee, that there was no update on that. Yeah. Do you have any further updates on when that would be produced? And another issue I wanted, I wanted to come in earlier, you mentioned about community uh, care, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very difficult to extrapolate how much has been spent. So there's really two questions in that, I suppose. Yeah, no, Do we have um, an update of when you'll be able to produce the figures? Yes. And would we be able to extrapolate how much money from frontline services is spent on community services, such as you know, health you know, officials, etc.? Sure. Um, you know, we've tried to find out what's going on within integration authorities, and it's been extremely difficult. Therefore, you know, my question is, do you know what's going on? And <laughs> how, what role does Parliament and this committee and others have in monitoring what's going on if we cannot find out? So, I mean, a lot of work has obviously gone on in this area, yeah. particularly in response to the issues raised by the committee, which I think you were just going to come so on to. I try and cover a few of those points. So your first one, um, the integration authorities, were working with them to have a, a first pass of a consolidated report in February. It will probably be January data, but in February. <laughs> um, and, and I'm part of that too, to look at it, to see whether it gives us all what we're we're looking for because it is absolutely true that you can go onto every integration authority website and you can look at their board papers. Um, that's that's not the same as trying to get a consolidated picture. I suspect when we start to do it, we'll find that there's some inconsistencies that we need to then iron out. But but our first pass of it will be will be February um, to have that. That's what we've agreed that we're working to. 
um, your wider points about things like um, community spend. So, so right now, so the information that I started off with saying that we're seeing it moving in the right direction, we're taking from the annual cost book, um, which is probably too far um, back for all of us to feel particularly satisfied with. So by introducing routine reporting, we'll be able to measure those key areas about um, primary care spend and about <coughs> community services spend on a regular basis, I hope quarterly, to have that. And I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be something we'd want to share with whoever wanted to have access and just make it publicly available. We we'll make sure we send that on to the committee proactively. Yeah, the, the third strand I would say is, um, again, we, we discussed this <coughs> at the time of the Audit Scotland Overview report that, that we were planning and developing a, a financial framework um, and we've, we're doing that work right now, and that will include social care data as well. So we'll be looking to the medium term to be able to set out our expectations on um, funding, on expenditure and on reform for health and for social care. Um, and we've designed that so that it does help us to answer the questions about shifting the balance. So I think all the points that you raised in the report, I... I have the same difficulty in trying to get that single picture. Um, I can go to individual parts of the system and I can ask for it on a um, on a reactive basis, but it's not there in one place, and that's what we're seeking to put in place. My only slight caution is that I think the first time we do it, it will it will probably show us that some things look um, odd, and it will probably be because there people have put them in different places. So we'll need to do a bit of work to tidy it up. But I'd, I'd like to give you that assurance that that work is is well underway. Thank you. Who will be doing it and who will be reporting it? So the, the consolidation on a, on a routine basis will be undertaken by the integration authorities um, and that will be information that then would be publicly um, available. So we'll, we'll still we'll work that through about whether that's something that gets published on um, on our, our website or whether it's the consolidated information. Consolidated information. The financial framework is something that we've committed to publish in, in spring. I think we're looking around about mm -hmm. end of March, beginning of April to do that. And I would think that that would be something that the committee would be. Uh -huh. would and be in interested terms of the in. consolidated information, when are we likely to get that? So that's what I'm saying. So the, the first pass of it will be will be February. So maybe February. be March before we would have it in a state that would be fit to, to publish. But I wouldn't expect it to be any longer than that. Um, and I was also going to make the offer in developing the financial framework that if either the committee want to um, give us some um, thoughts on that before it's published or are you speaking to, um, to, to Spice or whatever, then more than happy to take those comments on board because we're trying to get it, we're trying to deal with all the issues that people have raised about, you know, it's hard to get the big picture, it's hard to understand what things are moving in the right direction and, and we're working hard to try to simplify that and make it as straightforward as possible. So we'll be happy to get your thoughts on that. OK, thank you. Your case, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, Ash. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, under the uh, health board allocations, um, the line for uh, the transformation change budget, that's gone up from 38 million to 145.7 million. So that's uh, quite a significant increase in that budget. Um, can you explain what type of Thing you're anticipating is going to be achieved with the, the extra funding that's been given to that? Maybe you could give an ex example of the type of things that it might be to fund? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm going to just give you um, kind of headlines and, and Christine can come in with some more of the detail, but um, the, the transformation fund is uh, important uh, in that we have listened very much to boards uh, in the way they've telling us that actually making change and shifting resources, doing things differently can sometimes be quite challenging. And the Transformation Fund is a, a way of helping them to do that by driving some of that change and, and funding it uh, through that Transformation Fund. Uh, and so the priorities for that are around the shifting the balance of care, making sure that they can uh, shift and build up those community uh, health services. So the primary care, um, a, a key priority uh, for that. Um, looking at more regional working. So um, Christine mentioned earlier on that the message we're sending out to boards is that their plans really need to have a, a regional dimension uh, on both their capital outlook and also on their resource spending. So, um, for example, they're, they're looking at the development of a, a new hospital that shouldn't just be uh, about what that would do and 
services it would provide for that particular board. It should be about well, what what impact could that have in that that region? Um, in terms of uh, you know resource spending, uh, we would expect um, transformation to. Um, be uh, showing um, the, the shift in the balance of care, the shift to uh, primary care spend, to mental health spend, to um, make sure that, for example, the, the work around the drugs budget uh, and, and looking at more effective prescribing, um, that this fund is really to help gear up and um, accelerate the, the pace of change that we need to see. And we made the decision that that was best done through a funding stream that would help boards to do that. Christine, do you want to so say a, a couple of other um, examples of what will be in there? So things like the um, improvements in elective care through the Elective Access Collaborative would be funded through that um, investment in digital. So we've, we'll have the launch of the, the digital health and care strategy um, this year. Um, so receiving some funds for investment in, in things like that will be really important. We've also got work underway on radiology, shared services, um, we're moving on to labs now, um, and work on shared business systems across uh, across the system. So there are, th th this is all really underpinning the, the health and social care delivery plan and the milestones within it. So it's really just trying to carve out some um, funding on a, on a non-recurring basis to support that that fund and, and in addition to that as you say we've, we've got um the single largest investment is primary care and mental health transformation too so so we've not deliberately not allocated that out on an individual board basis that's one of those examples that hasn't gone out on an NRAC basis because there'll be some things that we will fund once um for the whole of the system and others that will be on a regional basis um we'll be getting the next version of the um. regional plans from the three um regions and from the national boards in March and we would seek to use that um, as the main basis in which we would decide to allocate funding but we do expect that funding to go out to boards and integration authorities in year. So the boards will actually maybe come to you with a proposal of, of what they would like to spend the money on and then you'll evaluate that and decide where to yeah. allocate the funding. So, so for instance within the national boards we know that one of the biggest propositions they're working on is about digital um, particularly how NHS 24 um, ambulance service NES can all come together to provide um, digital services. So, so we would expect there to be one funding stream, for instance, for something like that, same with the business systems. Um, the work on, on radiology is, is again being done as a national programme. So, so it won't be something that will be allocated to all boards, but we do expect all of that money to be, to be used within, within the system directly next year. Okay, thank you. And some of that transitional money, I mean, would that be allocated towards bed space because there's huge demand on beds mm. um, at a time when the, the policy is to reduce, you know, uh, people being in hospital whilst the social care system is not functioning as it should be to get people out. So is that an area where some of that transitional cash will go to maintain bed spaces as demand increases? Well, it's about making sure that the system is in balance and that, you know, has to be done carefully. Um, what I would say is that, you know, the acute bed reduction that we've seen over uh, over many years has really been mainly due to the different way of services being provided. So day surgery, for example, we're now seeing people have operations and they're out within 24 hours. That just wasn't the case. I was going to say 10 years ago, but even five years ago. So the way that, that beds are used is is different and therefore we have to make sure we get the right number uh, of, of acute beds. Where there are, the, um, there, there are two... Uh, main areas of reform here. One is on, on elective, so making sure that um, the way we deliver our elective services is as efficient and effective as it can be, and that's the work that Derek Bell is undertaking, looking at how we um, make sure with the plans for the elective centres that we maximise uh, the, 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 the best way of delivering elective procedures uh, and uh, that was, is going to be done on it with a regional focus as well. The other area is unscheduled care, and without a doubt, you know, if the the work that's going on to reduce unscheduled admissions and also uh, reduce a delayed discharge will will release capacity within the acute system. But it's about not, you know, it's about putting things in the right order. 
And obviously we have to make sure that those reductions in, of pressure within the system and therefore reduction on bed pressure are happening before you would uh, you know, uh, uh, do, remove any uh, acute capacity. So it has to be done in a way that is shifting the balance of care but doing it safely and making sure that both systems remain in balance. Uh, but we do know that there is use of the acute system that is being used by people who would be better treated elsewhere in a different setting and that's really where the focus of the the next uh, few years is going to be so i'm um, still not very clear is that where some of that transitional money will be put into it or not well the transitional money is is a, a part about building those services up um, to make sure that we can you know uh, in, ensure that those services in the community are reducing pressure on the acute services so it's about doing things in the right order that's why there's a huge chunk going into primary care to make sure that those services are being built up trying to reduce admission to hospital reducing delayed discharge so that people who are in an acute bed that don't need to be there are not there so that that releases pressure on the uh, acute system what there won't be though is a you know we, we need to make sure that given if you were to do nothing we would need far more acute beds going forward need to build you know a huge number of new hospitals but you know if we're going to do that we wouldn't be able to also spend that money on developing community services so this is about getting the system into balance it's not about the wholesale closure of acute beds it's about getting the system into balance so that we can cope with future demands on the system because we don't we you know we can't invest in uh, community services and then build a whole new generation of, of additional hospitals because there's just not the resources to do both. So we need to make sure that our acute system is able to cope, but not with just current demands, but future demands as well. Yeah, but before, I mean, prior to Christmas, we saw, um, for example, Edinburgh, assist, you know, up front saying we're sending people home but with no uh, appropriate social care package in place because we can't keep them in hospital. And St John's Hospital at the weekend, they're sending cancer patients home who were supposed to be in hospital or being sent home. Now, the bed capacity is not there, and that's what I'm asking, is that is if, if a board put forward a proposition for more bed space as a transitional option, would that be funded? Well, first of all, there will be more bed capacity through the elective centres. So the elective centres are going to provide um, a, additional capacity and the same way as the Golden Jubilee operates for elective procedures that are not interrupted by the flow of unscheduled uh, patients. But let me say something about the, the cases you've cited. Could, could, you you know, you, could, could you answer the question, though? If, if, if a board applied for transitional funding for more bed space, would it be granted or not? Well, they, they would be unlikely to do that because it runs and flies in the face of the direction of travel. We can't say we want to shift the balance of care and then put the money that was going to be going into shifting the balance of care into more acute beds. But if I can say to you very directly, you can't measure the um, demand for beds based on the midst of a winter period of exceptional it's winter pressures. Winter. That you can't do that. You have to look at acute bed capacity over the course of, of the year. You can't look at it in a two-week period and say that is what is needed in terms of acute bed capacity. What you need to do is to make sure you, we build that into winter pressures. And we have done that, although this year there have been exceptional winter pressures. And can I say in terms of what you cited about social care, people should never be sent home without any support. What sometimes happens is that people are sent home to be um, assessed at home. Uh, so that they can be assessed for their social care package within their own home environment rather than, with, than within hospital. What I would acknowledge, though, is that the pressures within the Royal Infirmary and St John's partly are exacerbated by the issue of delayed discharge within the Lothian system. The Lothian system at the moment accounts for about half of all delays within Scotland, so there is a particular problem that you and I both know are partly to do with the inability to recruit care staff, the local market concerns within the city of Edinburgh. And we are working very, very hard with those partnerships to overcome those particular local pressures and looking at really innovative solutions. But you have to base your acute bed capacity on what is required throughout the year, not just on what is required within the winter period. Nobody's suggesting it was just the winter period. I certainly wasn't. Um, um, Colin. <coughs> Thanks, convener. Um, um, good morning to the panel. As things currently stand, the, the budget um, specifically proposes a 1.8% a 
increase in funding for, for local health boards and some increases are actually as low as 1.5 per cent, Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Now, given that the most recent estimates suggest that uh, health inflation is about 2.3 per cent uh, this year and estimated to be 2 per cent next year, and that's before you take into account the government's proposed uh, pay policy, um, would you accept that from a health inflation point of view that, that, that this budget is actually a real terms cut? For local health boards? No, I certainly would not. Um, as I said, it's a, a, a real terms increase, a 2.2% real terms increase. Um, and actually, you know, in terms of Dunfries and Galloway, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they are a, an NRAC, uh, well, they are already above NRAC parity, um, quite well above NRAC parity, in fact. Um, uh, what I would acknowledge, though, is that there are additional, as well as, as general inflation, there are additional pressures, um, whether that's like the, the drugs budget, for example, is one. And that's why it's not just about investment and upfront investment in our health service as we are doing. It's also about reform and changing the way we do things. So it is important, for example, that prescribing practice um, is uh, is the best and is... is, um, the, is um, common uh, the, uh, throughout Scotland rather than uh, differing practices in, in differing areas that we need to make sure uh, that every pound of investment is being used as efficiently and as effective as possible and that's why when we, t we talk about investment and reform uh, always in the same sentence because in order to make sure that these pressures uh, are able to be met and at the same time the transformation of services goes ahead then as well as the real terms increase the funding it will require those reforms in order to release resources to be spent in a more effective way. Christine, do you want to say something about the inflation point? So, so, so overall, the funding for, for boards is 1.8%, but you're right that we've done a minimum of uh, general inflation, which is 1.5%. And, and this comes back also to the the, the consequences of a, of a formula. So based on the formula, Dumfries and Galloway is overfunded. Um, now, I know that Dumfries and Galloway will not feel over overfunded, but the formula... That that's the reason for for the one point five percent. So un unless we start to put additional money into the boards that are below parity, we won't reach that sense of of parity. Because what we don't want to do is take money from boards, and I don't think that that's anything that anybody would would support us doing. So that that one point eight percent is is above general inflation. Um, I, I, I would think that everybody accepts that real terms, when we talk about real terms, is based on general inflation. It's, it's a measure that government use. Um, Audit Scotland in the report, um, I think, are content to reference general inflation as the way in which we calculate real terms. So I think it's true to say that there's a real terms increase, but at the same time, as Cabinet Secretary says, to, to, to acknowledge that there are other, other pressures on the health and care system which are over and above that, um, and that's why we're investing so much in reform, but it does also mean that the system will still require to make savings of a similar similar level than they have up until now because of that position until um, until the system finds a way to, to recalibrate. So you, you're not you're not wrong in what you're saying about the pressures in in the system. There are different ways in which people calculate health inflation um, from anything from from two percent to four or five percent depending on, on what you include within it so that I wouldn't deny that there are further pressures beyond general inflation but I think there is a real terms um, uplift in the system um, and there is additional funding for reform which is 175 million pounds and that's why it's really important that we do find a way to use that not to fund um, existing pressures further but to get that that change that we're looking for um, so so th Anything that we can do that means that people can be treated outside of the acute sector, um, it's got to be something that takes us in the right direction as we do that. And that's what we really need to make sure that we invest that, that total funding and transformational change to get that best return over the, over the next five to ten years. I think in all that you've confirmed that the uplift to local health boards is 1.8% and whatever way you look at health inflation, it's above that figure. But... Can I well, the look specifically on... Including transformation is 2.2%, though, no, because that money will go out to boards. It's just kept... With, with respect, we don't know what that allocation to health boards is. We, we've just touched on the point that um, you appear to suggest that Dumfries and Galloway gets too much money, uh, but you have no idea how the transformational change fund will be allocated. So, you know, you can't take that into account as allocated to local health boards when you actually 
specifically have already said that's for additional um, pressures, not current uh, work that's being carried out. But can I look specifically at one of the, the main pressures on, on health boards, which will be the, uh, the pay policy? Now, Spice have estimated that will cost about £170 million pounds, uh, in the forthcoming year. Do you agree with that figure? And has that figure been taken into account in your allocation of funding to health boards? So, so let me just say a couple of things. First of all, Christine McLaughlin didn't say uh, Dumfries and Galloway had too much money. What she said was it was a, a, an NRAC... Uh, it was above NRAC parity. Uh, now, you know, I'm sure that you know around this table there are members who represent boards that are below NRAC parity. So what I need to do as the health secretary is to balance that because regularly I get asked in the chamber from members representing Lothian or Grampian about being under NRAC parity. So you know we have a system here that has to be fair to all, uh, and that means that uh, there has to be a, a formula that gradually uh, makes sure that all boards uh, come to, to parity. Uh, so there's, it's not about whether a board has too much money. It's about where they are in terms of distance from NRAC parity. In terms of pay, um, the, the pro I've la laid out in my opening remarks the position on pay. Uh, the res we have uh, resources um, uh, uh, within the budget for um, uh, that will go towards the pay settlement. However, we have taken on face value what the Treasury have said, and that is that the recommendations from the independent pay review body will be fully funded uh, uh, for, uh, from uh, that. And that will mean that we will get consequentials that we would expect to flow uh, from the Treasury in terms of helping to meet uh, any pay review commitment that comes from the independent pay review body. And what we have said is, as well as setting out our pay policy, that we will make sure that staff in Scotland uh, are treated at least as fairly as staff uh, in the, the rest of the UK. So it is an unusual uh, set of circumstances this year because we are awaiting essentially a, a pay review body which will then have consequences for the level of funding that flow in order to meet that pay policy. So, you know, I think that is, um, you know, a, a, something we've no, probably not faced previously in terms of the way pay has been funded. But That's right. Know. So, so to clarify, I mean, your figures are the same figures that we are working to, that the um, the, the impact of the, the pay policy is, is just under £160 million pounds if that was applied to the NHS um, in Scotland next year. Boers would have always been planning on a 1% increase, which is about half of that. Um, so that's already factored into Boers' plans for 18-19. So the unknown is the extent to which the, the pay review body recommendations for the NHS and the extent to which there are additional consequentials flowing from the UK government um, position. And we won't know that until, we, we don't expect to know that until about June of this year. But, but the question was, does your allocations to health boards take into account what is currently your proposed pay policy, um, which is a 3% rise for NHS staff? Is that taken into account, the £170 million, point, is that taken into account in the funding you provide for um, health boards? But, but you touched on the issue of um, potential consequentials and abandoned consequentials from the UK government, depending on what they do with regards to, to pay uh, for the NHS in England. So are you specifically saying you will give a commitment to fully allocate all abandoned consequentials to the National Health Service in Scotland that come from any additional funding that goes to the NHS in England? Yes. All consequences will go on. And the, back to the, the previous question, does your allocations to health boards take into account what is your current preferred pay policy, minimum pay policy, which is to provide a 3% rise to NHS staff? Well, as Christine has set out, we've boards have already got uh, an element of that pay policy built in. Uh, but you know the final pay policy 100%. as it lands will require us to utilise consequential resources that would come in terms of the independent pay review body. What we have said is that we will make sure in the resources that we allocate, uh, that are partly already allocated and will be allocated, we'll make sure that staff in Scotland are uh, receive um, at least as fair a settlement uh, as the rest of the UK in terms of the independent pay review body. But we don't know what the independent pay review body is going to say as yet. So we will have to wait and see what they say before we know what the final cost will be uh, for that pay review settlement. So, you know, it is a unusual 
set of circumstances this year, which requires us to um, uh, try to predict to some level, but you know, we will have to wait until we see what the independent peer review body says. Christina, I have to say I'm not entirely clear how you're actually proposing within the budget. You've set out draft budget to actually meet what you say is the minimum 3% pay rise. But can I, can I look specifically then, if you're not going to say exactly whether or not that funding is built into allocations already um, proposed for health boards um, for NHS pay. Let, let's look at the issue of, of social care pay then, given the fact that we do have integration with health and social care. Now, the draft budget proposes to cut council funding by £135 million in real terms. In whatever way you want to define real terms, that's a fact. Now, at a time that social care demand is, is obviously rising, and you've actually said in answer to a previous question that your £66 million that's contained within, frankly, a cash-flat local government budget is allocated for things such as uh, sleepovers, living wage, uh, the free personal and nursing care payments, uh, and the carer strategy. So that's effectively ring-fenced or supposed to cover those particular areas. So where exactly is the funding coming from to meet an increase in pay for social care workers? First of all, as I said earlier, the £66 million is in addition, of course, to the £550 million that's already uh, been uh, invested into social care uh, via health resources. So over half a billion pounds is already in the system working now um, to improve uh, social care provision and indeed has uh, helped to deliver the living wage for uh, non-council uh, staff. The £66 million that you've referred to is additional money in 2018-19 that will help to meet uh, the commitments that I set out, including the up rate to uh, the living wage for non-council staff uh, and the, um, the requirements of the carers legislation and indeed the uh, sleepover uh, rates as well. Those are discussions that have gone on with local government in order to, uh, to prioritise those elements um, within the overall local government allocation. And you know, we, as we said earlier on, have no reason to believe that local government is not going to deliver on those shared priorities. Why would they uh, pay the living wage up to now and then not continue to pay the living wage when we know it is an important part of the recruitment and retention of social care staff? So those are agreed priorities with local government. Um, I, I have no reason to believe that that's not going to be delivered. I don't think Christine has either. Um, and we will continue to work with local government to make sure that that is the case. Can, can we just be clear what your pay policy is? It goes beyond the living wage. It includes a minimum 3% increase for public sector workers who earn £30,000 or less, a 2% increase for those between 30000 and 80000 So you've talked about the £66 million covers uh, the living wage and sleepover shifts. Where is the funding coming from to cover the increase that will be on social care as a result of your, your other pay policy proposals? Well, the, Where's that funding the pay coming from? It's not contained within the £66 million. Local government have seen £135 million cut in real terms in their budget. At the very least, they're getting a cash, a flat budget, which includes areas now being ring-fenced for social care. So where is the funding coming from to pay the increase in, uh, in social care, given the fact that it, the demand is increasing at the same time? Well, the, the pay policy um, is a, a government pay policy, and that will be effective a, across government and will be uh, paid for out of the, the allocations that have been given. I mean, we've laid out today uh, our position on NHS and the uh, how we will meet that commitment. Uh, I've laid out to you today the support, the additional support being given to local government in order to meet the living wage uh, commitment. But you know the the general pay policy across the rest of the uh, of government is laid out in the, the pay policy, and, and that would be expected to be delivered in other sectors. Christine, is that yeah, just just for um, clarification, which I think maybe what's what you're, you're asking for, there isn't a specific funding stream for. Um, for, for pay awards um, in any of the sectors and there is no specific funding stream beyond the uplift to boards for the NHS until such times as we have clarity on on consequentials from the, the UK government. So if that's if that's a bit that you weren't um, clear about in the in the budget, there isn't a specific line for um, for pay awards. If there's a difference between what the pay review body awards and the policy is that going to be made up by government? 
Yeah, I mean, we've made the commitment, but we, you know, we would expect that you know if the Treasury have made a commitment to deliver um, on a, a pay policy that the independent pay review body delivers, then our input into the independent pay review body has obviously laid out our government's pay policy, um, and the pay policy is a commitment that we have made. I would be disappointed if the Treasury uh, didn't make that commitment good uh, and you know we would expect uh, Scotland to receive its fair share of uh, resources flowing from that commitment. Um, I've had some indication of some of the discussions that have been taking place on a UK basis uh, and there's nothing that would, would lead me to believe that that commitment isn't going to be made as things stand at the moment. Uh, I would hasten to add. So, you know, I would be confident uh, as things stand that, that uh, the independent pay review body uh, recommendation and, and what then flows from that uh, will, uh, ins will enable us to deliver on our pay policy commitment. But, you know, if there is any shortfall, of course, we would make that up to make sure that what we have said and we're going to deliver is delivered. But I'm confident that what we would see from the indep independent pay review body would uh, would be in line with uh, our pay policy. Uh, okay, um, Jenny. Thank you, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, you mentioned Scotland's Year of Young People, um, and it's obviously a huge focus for government this year. Um, but CAM's waiting times continue to impact upon some of Scotland's most vulnerable people. The, the budget line projects a £17 million increase uh, going into 2018-19 in terms of mental health services. So how will you ensure that health boards use that funding directly to support child and adolescent mental health services if it's not ring-fenced within that budget line? So, I mean, as you've said, that the 2018-19 budget has been increased by £17 million, which is 32% uh, mm -hmm. as part of the commitment to increase the, the mental health workforce by uh, an extra 800 workers over the next five years and, indeed, for the transformation of of CAMS. Um, the budget also uh, includes uh, £30 million as part of the existing commitment of £150 million on improvement and innovation in mental health services over five years. Um, and what we need to make sure, and I think this is probably what your, your, your point um, is, is getting at, that, uh, that we need to make sure that that then follows through into the decisions that are made by boards and integration authorities. Uh, a lot of work is going on uh, to make sure that is the case. So the ministerial strategic group that I referenced earlier on that we uh, jointly chair with COSLA has made the investment in mental health one of its key priorities. And it is looking at how we ensure through some of the processes Christine talked about earlier in terms of tracking where planned investment goes, that mental health is visible and seen mm -hmm. uh, within those local uh, budget set setting processes. Um, so I think it's fair to say that we have um, come to a collective view that it's not enough just to allocate the resources um, from Scottish Government at a high level and then assume and uh, that, that those resources will always find their way uh, to the front line in a way that we need them to see, given that we have these very specific commitments um, uh, to grow the workforce. So we will be doing things in a, a different way. Christine can uh, elaborate a bit more, but you know it is has been very much identified as a priority of that strategic group um, and looking at making sure there's visibility to that spend in terms of the plan spend at a local yeah. level. And, and the one additional thing I would add to that is that in the funding letter um, with the draft budget, mm -hmm. we've said to the system that we expect there to be a real terms increase in yeah. the existing yeah. mental health spend be to, to, to protect against and guard yeah. against any um, reductions in existing spend as we put more money in. Um, and I, again, through being able to report on a more regular basis, we yeah. would look to see that. One of the things I'd like to see um, confirmation on as budgets are being approved for next year so that we're not waiting till a year after the, the event to make sure that that's happened. So yeah. I think I would say of all the budget um, areas for 1819, it, it feels like the one that, w that has been given most um, protection. I appreciate that. Um, I suppose my concern as a Fife MSP is that there are five health boards, as you'll know nationally, who didn't meet that 18-week target. Um, will any of that funding then be directed at those health boards who weren't able to get there? Well, there's also an improvement programme where boards that are not meeting the target are, are being worked with specifically uh, through the improvement team 
And that has actually led uh, some of the boards that ha are now meeting their target. It was through that improvement work that actually has helped them and investment, but the improvement work as well. So that they do things differently and work out you know, what it is that they're either not doing or need to change. Where If there are staffing issues, what are those and how do they address them? So work has, uh, very detailed work is going on with individual boards uh, to, to make those improvements. And that would be the case for those remaining boards that have uh, yet to meet the target. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the, the spend um, and the work on uh, CAMS and, and, and other areas, um, how can we track that and what's been spent on and so whether there's improvements being made? So if we're, so in terms of tracking this, the spend, if we're going to give you the consolidated information th for integration authorities, then it would have mental health clearly within that. So I think that would be the easiest the, the spend and the result of that spend. So when you say the result of that spend, but do you mean in relation to particularly the, being treated the target, yeah. the performance targets? I'm sure we could put those two mm. together and give you regular information on that. Okay, thank Just you. be helpful to know how often you would want to, to receive that, but I'm sure we could do that. Okay, we'll have a think about that. <laughs> um, Anyone else? Alex in this one. Yeah. Thank Miles. you, Convener. Um, I'd like to follow up on Jenny Gilruth's uh, line of questioning. Um, if we accept that from the £17 million, we'll have to find the 3% uplift for existing mental health workforce within the health service. Um, and then even though the 800 additional workers is over the next five years, ultimately when we get to 800, that's going to be at least £20 million, if not more, a year. Um, what of this £17 million will be left for CAMS? What is the breakdown between what you expect to do in terms of meeting that 3% pay obligation for existing mental health staff, for recruiting the first tranche of the 800 workers, um, what is then left for CAMS? Um, the 3% pay uh, commitment won't come out of the mental health money. So the, pay, the pay commitment is the pay commitment. Uh, what I laid out earlier was the process for that in that uh, we have resources within uh, the NHS, some of which have already been allocated uh, around uh, and, and boards have also some planning assumptions with regard to pay, uh, but there is also the unknown quantity of what the independent pay review body uh, will say and what the consequentials will flow from that. That is a separate funding sheet. It won't come out of the, the £17 million. But, but the 17 you, you million have, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, that's up to the discretion of the boards how they spend that money, isn't it? Well, but mean, they, well, no, well, to some extent, but they won't be spending it on pay. Pay is a separate funding okay. stream. The £17 million pounds, uh, is an uplift for mental health services uh, where we need to make sure that the... That what happens next is that, that that resource has visibility in terms of what priorities it goes on and to make sure that there is, a, as Christine reminded me, we had set out in the letter uh, that there was a requirement for a real terms spending increase in mental health. I think in recognition that sometimes the intentions of increased spend from the Scottish Government don't always find their way through to the decisions that are made locally. And, you know, I think we've accepted in the area of mental health that that was an area we needed to address, which is why the letter says there has to be a real terms increase. In terms of what that money is then spent on, I mean, obviously there'll be some, within mental health, some local discretion. So if a board is already meeting its CAMS target, for example, it may prioritise other areas of mental health spend for their, uh, for that allocation. But where they're not meeting their, their CAMS target, we would expect that to be a priority for that spend. So though obviously the, you know, we would expect boards to... Uh, um, set out clearly to us what their priorities would be for that for that spend. And, and we've asked for that as part of the um, the plans that we would agree with boards for eighteen nineteen and and in the integration authority plans to be very specific about their plans on mental health. Um, but just for the avoidance of doubt, we we are saying very clearly that we expect existing spend to continue, and um, and to have a real terms real terms one point five percent real terms increase and the addition, additional 17 million on top of that. So if we were fast forwarding a year from now, I would expect you to be saying to us, well, have you seen that? Where's the evidence of that? That's what we'll be keeping track of very closely over at, at, for the start of the year and as we go through the year. OK, let me come at this from a slightly de and separate angle, which is of the 800 new workers, how many are in place now and how many are going to be recruited in the next 
calendar year, financial year? Well, those, that is part of the, the modelling going forward in terms of uh, what the agreement with boards uh, is and making sure we have definitions of who is included within those 800 staff. So what is going on around that at the moment so that we can track and be able to tell you and the rest of the committee over the course of the rest of this parliament uh, and establishing the baseline for that. So that um, work is, is ongoing to make sure we've got the, the baseline because there are already uh, staff that have been funded that are new that would come within the ambit of, of uh, the, the, the type of workforce that we're trying to build. Uh, but we want to establish what the, the clear baseline is in terms of measuring progress from here on, and that work is ongoing at the yeah, moment. I don't, I don't have that to hand, but I'm sure we can, we can, yeah, we give can you the time provide scales, that. With, that the time scales for the planned increase over the five-year yeah. period. We can provide you with that. And, and just to finish, Camina, if I may, I mean, because I go back to my original point that ultimately when we have these 800 new mental health workers in place, they will cost at least £20 million a year. So that's in addition to what we are spending on mental health right now. If we're only talking about a £17 million uplift, we're going to have to meet that with an additional uplift year on year in mental health. Is that the intention of this government? Well, we see the growth in mental health spend continuing um, in order to meet that commitment. And of course, you know, we wouldn't, that's going to be, you know, you wouldn't expect that commitment to be able to be delivered in a one year time frame. It's going to take longer than that. And therefore, we, the mental health spend in line would increase in order to uh, provide the, the resources to deliver that. Thank you, Convener. Um, ISD figures regarding bank and agency staff show that last year £142 million was spent in 2016-17. That was up from £134.5. Uh, um, like this question. Right. Come Don't back to you on that. Sandra, do you want in mental health issues? I'll come oh, back to you. It's similar to what I had asked uh, earlier on uh, in regards to obviously mental health funding and uh, its budget, etc. But it's how that budget is spent as far as... I think we're all concerned how it works out. <clears throat> and uh, I just wanted to be a bit of clarification. You mentioned, uh, in the papers we have, we mentioned community health service budget. And I'd already raised the fact about community health service and you're going to come back with a paper in March. So I think it's important that we, we get to the nub of the situation where we have the extra money going into community health, but there's a partnership aspect of it also. So I'd just like a bit of clarification um, when you produce a paper in March in regard to community health services, will that have some of the mental health budget, how it's spent in there? Because we had the great, you know, Yahoo when Margaret Thatcher was there about community health and people were just flung out with no money to support them. So I think it's important we look at the basics of where the money is spent. So will that be coming in in any report you give in March about the mental health budget, i.e. under the community aspect as well, because a lot of the work is carried out in the community, most of it, rather than the hospitals. So the Sorry. Part, part of the way we, we see the shift <coughs> in spend is, is through mental health. Um, so, so yes, we would expect it to be part of it. So, But it, I mean, if, if you are asking for maybe more detailed information about mental health, then that might be something we should do as a one-off for you to understand not just the bottom line, but how it's being spent, because mm -hmm. um, that's information we would need to, to collect. We, what, what I'm aiming to do in that first report is tell you the, the total amount on different components mm -hmm. rather than how it's spent. So if you really, if it's really how it's spent, then we would, we would um, probably the best thing to do was to do a, a more detailed analysis for you and provide that. Yeah, the, the position separately. I'm taking, can be just a small one, is there's so many um, various areas within mental health I integration know. and social care. Yep. Uh, local government has a lot to do with it as well. You know, it's a bit good, in my opinion, anyway, to see exactly how it's spent on the ground and how it does the money does benefit the people who are yeah. really needing it basically I, I agree and it's one of those areas where it's it's relatively straightforward to get the direct spend on it but be able to identify all of these other areas mm -hmm. can, can take a bit that more time good, so but i think if everyone agrees it's an area that we need to um that, that would be worth doing it then we could certainly commission we'll, that we'll make support. contact regarding that <coughs> um, Sandra, do you want to follow up on the alcohol and drugs partnerships oh, yes Kavina, thank you uh, good morning uh, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you very much for, for obviously, in your you know, introductory remarks about the £20 you know, million, pounds, which is additional for uh, alcohol and drug partnerships. However, having looked at the evidence, uh, basically, uh, although it will increase 
We don't really know how it will be distributed to health boards or whether it will be distributed to health boards, uh, and it's not clear to this committee with the figures we've had uh, the current level of spending on alcohol and drug services. It doesn't seem to be... It is recorded, I know the government records it, but uh, the transparency isn't there for the committee or anyone else. And I just wonder if you would agree the fact that the, trans the lack of the transparency makes it very difficult for us to see how much of the budget is there <clears throat> and whether the Scottish Government would agree to um, publishing the information that they have on ADP budgets. So well, we'll we'll certainly look to to see what further information uh, can can be published uh, to be as helpful as possible. Uh, I should add, obviously, that the um, that twenty million is in addition to the um, the funding that already goes to boards baseline funding, and actually, boards and partnerships spend an awful lot more money on alcohol and drug. Uh, spend than than the twenty million, so it would probably be helpful for us to maybe set out in a follow up that, that additional spend that that goes in because that's the vast majority of it. Um, in terms of the twenty million, um, we are in discussions with um, boards and partnerships at the moment about the priorities for that spend because we would like um, to ensure that as well as. Um, what ADPs do in terms of their their the day to day uh, delivery of services that there is an element of that fund for uh, transformation and creation of of new services and uh, un and meeting unmet needs and really trying to uh, make sure with the the delivery of the refreshed substance misuse framework that there's resources that can help to deliver some of those priorities that are going to uh, emerge from that so it's a balance of making sure that um the you know the resources are providing um for services in the here and now but also that there's an element for the development of new services but we can follow up um with some further detail if you'd find that helpful just a very just a very small and um, thank you very much for that yeah because we do need transparency and this comes from the fact that uh, actually spice had to put in an fy to get right, some information okay. which obviously from a committee point of view uh, you know isn't so great uh, that's why i was asking we know that uh, the government uh, keeps has information mm -hmm. would you be able to provide it and i quite understand that it's not quite as simple as just one budget it goes there and that's where it's spent. It's all different ones. And it's just obviously the minutiae of it to try and get, get to the, the, the nub of it. So I think it comes back to that earlier point that the, that the funding transferred to board baseline. So we don't, in, in previous years, it was a budget that we held. So we could very easily tell you what mm. the total budget was. When we transfer it to the system and you, you leave it to local um, determination, then uh, unless you have a mechanism to get a cons right. consolidated report, then it's either we go out and ask everyone what they're spending, or you you have an FOI. So I don't I I don't believe that there is any withholding of information going on. I think it's just that we've we've we're dealing with funding in a different way. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid this consolidated report being the answer to everything, but <laughs> I think it will give you a much better overview of the position because you know if I look at any integration authorities published. Um, finance reports, I can see substance misuse or, or a, mm -hmm. a, an equivalent title in them. So there is a level of local transparency on the spend. What there isn't is uh, right now an easy way to pull all that together and give you a, a single position mm -hmm. across the country. And that's that's what you're asking for. And that's what we're saying that we'll, yeah. we'll start to pull together. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we can certainly do that. The way in which the £20 million will be invested um, will come through the refreshed, refreshed framework, so there will be a bit of a time delay before we can give you the, the full information on that. That's fine, thank you. Last year, the, a significant number of the committee members were very unhappy about what happened with the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership budget. Um, now we see £20 million go back in. It's actually only a net increase of £4 million if you take account of last year's reductions. But the reality is that we've got the worst drug deaths rate in Europe. We have a drugs disaster on our hands in terms of um, um, deaths from drugs. Is this anywhere near enough to start to really tackle what is a real public health crisis in, uh, on the streets where people are dying? Well, 
Aileen Campbell in her statement laid out that there was going to be a renewed focus on those uh, drug users who have perhaps been using drugs for many, many years. They're getting, they're getting older. They have a multitude of different uh, chronic health conditions. And uh, it's almost like, I think it was like a seek and treat that there was going to be a, a focus on actually really uh, trying to proactively engage with that community because that those are, that is the area where those drug deaths were emerging from. So a really a, very much a refreshed approach uh, focusing on um, the, the individuals uh, concerned to try and engage them with services to, to address the very point that you're making a uh, convener. So uh, it is a different approach. Um, I think Aileen Campbell laid out in some detail why it is different and how it will be different. Uh, and uh, you know the resources, new resources will, will be aligned to those uh, that refocused uh, commitment. Um, we are dealing with a, a, a generation of, of drug users who you know are now um, you know in their, their later years and that brings with it a bit of a challenge uh, to uh, and many of them don't engage with, with uh, services in a way that we would like. So a lot of work is is being done to try and look at new ways of of doing that and to look at how to address uh, some of their health needs. Also should say a lot of work going on between ourselves and the Justice Department um, to uh, around the prison population so that uh, when uh, pe uh, pe uh, people are coming out of prison that they are uh, better supported, uh, particularly around issues of, of alcohol uh, and drugs. And I think that is going to help to possibly um, provide a, a better a support system for for people who are at that vulnerable position. I, I mean, I, I may follow that up personally and write to you about that okay, because there's a whole fine. new generation of um, young people coming through uh, who are experiencing drugs, particularly cocaine. The streets are are mm. awash with it, and that's not the older generation that we've known about for some time. This is a whole new generation that um, have grave concerns about. But anyway, we short of time on that. I'll write to you um, okay, privately on that. Um, Who's next? Uh, Brian. Yeah, Panel. Um, as part of the committee's call for evidence in relation to the pre-budget scrutiny, um, we received a quite a few written submissions from a number of sports bodies raising concerns about the transparency um, in relation to the sports budget. Um, the suggestion is that more detail on the sports legacy physical activity budgets would be uh, would support uh, that better scrutiny. So with, with that in mind, uh, can I ask what the reasons were to uh, to change to include the sports budget within the overall health budget uh, and whether you actually agree uh, with the comments regarding the lack of transparency in the sports budget lines and, and what action you could perhaps take to address this? Um, well, I mean, we're happy to provide as, as much detail uh, as possible. Um, I mean, I think the... The rationale um, for um, trying to better integrate the sports budget into the health budget was really because of the, the, the I guess, the, the, the dimension of trying to look at physical activity and, and active living as part of the, uh, the, the, um, the health response rather than it sitting somewhere else. Um, and therefore, you know, the the, the budget um, that uh, is is allocated to not just Sports Scotland, but in terms of the active um, uh, programme, is really try to um, do some of the prevention work. And actually, Sports Scotland themselves have done a lot over the years to change their focus. So they're doing more around uh, looking at um, programmes that support um, uh, children and, and young people to be active rather than it being necessarily about specific sports. So um, I should point out that sports uh, uh, Scotland's budget is going to increase uh, by uh, two million pounds uh, to 31.7 million pounds uh, and that is to deliver um, the, the services that they uh, deliver and also to look at what more can be done. Um, we are also, as I said in my opening remarks, um, underwriting a fall in, in national lottery income uh, for Sports Scotland of up to £3.4 million because I know there was a lot of concern from sports bodies around the fall in income from the, the national lottery. Um, and we would hope that the UK government will uh, be looking at uh, how it addresses uh, those concerns. So, 
Um, you know, the active healthy lives uh, line um, is a uh, there's a new budget for 2018-19 and um, looks at uh, trying to ensure that um, we are hitting the right, doing the right things, particularly early intervention. And um, you know, happy to provide more detail on that if you'd find it helpful. Um, just for clarification, the extra two million pounds that's coming into the Sports Scotland budget brings it back up to the level it was at two years ago, um, given that it was cut. Uh, the budget was cut a couple of times, and I think um, for me, the sort of transparency around um, sports delivery is predominantly done through councils as well. Uh, I just wonder what links you, you links your, uh, you have with the programmes that, that Sports Scotland are delivering, um, with the the increased uh, financial burden that's going on to uh, councils just now to deliver uh, these kind of programmes. Well, of course, uh, local government remains a, a key deliverer of of sport, uh, and obviously the decision to continue business rates relief for uh, sport and leisure centres, I think will help to make sure that the, the good work that's going on within uh, local authorities uh, continues. Um, there are Sports Scotland work very closely with local authorities, as I'm sure you're aware, in developing uh, plans to uh, deliver um, a more active programmes, a lot of work within schools, for example, that Sports Scotland are involved in, particularly around uh, making sure that um, before, during and after school programmes uh, are delivered, as well as supporting the, um, the commitment to uh, physical education and having a minimum delivery of that. Um, you know, all of this is within a, a context of a budget that is in increasing due to the tax decisions that we have made. If those tax decisions were made differently, then there would be even less money for local government and the NHS. So these are political decisions that each and every one of us around this table has to make when we're deciding what uh, resources should be allocated to any part of the public sector. Can I just, uh, just for clarification, I wanted to understand um, of what your understanding is of this, the, the, the money that Sports Scotland have, what their spend uh, uh, should be on as compared to what the lottery funding spend uh, is allocated for? Is there, is there, is there a, a, a different allocation? There? Well, there, there will be. I mean, the national lottery allocation will be uh, to meet the requirements of the national lottery in terms of what the programmes are that they've agreed to fund. So Sports Scotland will have different funding lines for different programmes depending on what funding stream is funding which, which you know, is not an easy thing for them if they're relying on different funding streams, which is why it was important uh, to underwrite the, the fall uh, in, in not national lottery income because it gives a bit of, of breathing space for Sports Scotland to look at uh, the programmes that they're running uh, while uh, discussions are ongoing, obviously, with the UK government around uh, national lottery resources. So, um, you know, I think you know, they, I'm not saying it's an easy task, but there is something that they require to do in terms of the the, the relative uh, programmes and how how they are resourced. And just just finally, if I can ask, the Sports uh, Scotland allocation does that incorporate a, a, a capital spend? Uh, the capital spend uh, to Sports no, Scotland is just resource. resource, I in, think. But we can come issue. back and just be sure about that. I think the capital okay. now, is now concluded, but I can check that for you. We'll, we'll come back and clarify okay. that. Okay. Ivan? Uh, thank you. Um, and I think we've, um, we've come back full circle to talk about performance and, uh, and outcomes. I'm having spent an hour and a half talking about the, uh, the inputs and that perhaps suggests how far we've got to come in, the, in terms of where the, uh, the narrative journalism we talk about. Um, the, uh, the the performance of the uh, of the, the portfolio. Um, as I said at the start, to, to my mind, it's critically important that we focus on the outcomes. I think everybody kind of agrees with that, um, and also the relationship between that and indicators and targets. And I don't want to go into that too much just now because we're going to come on and talk about that in the next uh, the next session um, about the Harry Burns report. But what I would say is that certainly echoing what Harry Burns said, the landscape to me does look confusing. You've got the national performance um, framework indicators, you've got local development plans, you've got the integration indicators all kind of cut across each other. Um, the budget report along with that comes an assessment against 
well, there's 25 indicators in there that are health related, allegedly, but when you look through a whole bunch of them, to my mind, the impact that the health budget can, can impact on those is minimal to zero. Um, so I'm not quite sure why why they're in there. So I suppose that there is a question around about do you think we're measuring the right things even at that micro level and how effective is, is, is what's in the budget report in terms of um, what we're focused on? Um, and then drilling down to the indicators that are there of the 25, there's four where allegedly you're missing or you are missing um, or the performance is worsening, let's put it that way, because there are no targets. Um, it's the performance is worsening against previous years. Of those four, I'm looking at them and two of them, I'm saying, I don't know why they're in there. One of them is road deaths and one of them is poverty, which frankly, the impact, unless you correct me if I'm wrong, but the impact that you can have on uh, as the health budget on those is, is, I would suggest, minimal. The two that are missing are alcohol-related admissions and the percentage of adults assessing their health as good or very good. Now, if we were to take it at face value, and this was a robust performance measurement system, Notwithstanding everything that's been said in the last hour and a half, you would say that those are the only two areas where the health portfolio has fallen down. Now, I think we would probably all agree that that's probably not the case, which to my mind kind of suggests that there are major weaknesses in the way this is set up and what we measure. But I'd just like to get your reflection on that, A, in terms of is the system doing what it should do in, in terms of measuring stuff, and B, on those two specifics, if you get any comments. Uh, yeah, I think I think laid out like that. I think you make a fair point that uh, sometimes we may overcomplicate uh, matters, and uh, we have all you know, the, the outcomes that uh, on the national performance framework. Um, you know, and, and I think we should have have a look at that because you know in terms of the day to day priority in terms of outcomes, I really have shifted very much towards the integrated agenda. So you know the focus is on. Um, uh, preventing admission to hospital, or reducing uh, uh, unscheduled care, tackling delayed discharge, uh, uh, looking at um, some of the early years' work around uh, 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 reducing um, uh, uh, some of the, you know, the, and, and making progress around the indicators in terms of, of, of early years' uh, progress with the in the health visitor uh, program and so on and so forth. So really, in terms of what we think about of the performance and uh, where we focus our attention, it's probably a bit of a mismatch in terms of those overall. So I think it's probably something we need to think about as we take the national performance framework forward. I would just say, though, in terms of one of the indicators you mentioned about poverty, now, what I've always said is that you know the health service... Um, in itself has a big contribution to make towards tackling poverty, but it can't do it of its own. Uh, tackling inequality and health inequalities can't be done by the health service alone, but it does have a contribution to make. So if you look at the, the role of health visitors in terms of early years, the family nurse partnership, the, the making sure that children get the best start in life, um, all of those, those inputs um, should uh, uh, be important in having better outcomes for those children and we have a focus on that uh, so i i think we should take away what you've said and have a look at with our colleagues in, in government uh, across government around the national performance framework and whether or not those um are really a reflection of where we are with the priorities that are set on a day-to-day -day basis for the, the health service so we'll, we'll take that and have a look at it thank you Fine, Ivan. Yeah. yeah. Miles, do you want to raise your Thank final you. point? Yes. And my question was regarding agency and bank staff. And looking at the ISD figures which were published, it showed £142 million was spent in 2016-17. That was up from 134.5. I raised this question this time last year. And both the Cabinet Secretary and Ms McLaughlin said that overall you expected to see a minimum 25% reduction this year in agency staff costs. So my question is really, what's gone wrong over the last year and why are we seeing it increasing further? Um, well, first of all, I'm glad you've given me the opportunity to highlight uh, a number of things around this in the context of the budget. Um, so the first of all, it's important to say that nurse agency spend is about 0.4% of the, the total budget. It is very small indeed. And we have to make a, uh, we have to be clear of the difference between bank and agency nurse. So, you know, bank nurses are, are NHS nurses who are doing 
extra shifts through the bank as opposed to an agency which is obviously taking a, a, an element of, of uh, funding uh, for it, its services and all of the issues that that, that raises. Uh, what we are doing around it is we have increased uh, in terms of the budget for this year an increase of 16.7 million pounds uh, um, in respect of the projected increase in student intakes for 2018-19 on the uh, student nursing and midwifery pre-registration fees and bursary budgets because of course we've kept the, bu the, bursary, bu the bursary here in Scotland uh, to enable us to deliver the 2,600 additional nursing and midwifery training places over the course of this parliament. The reason that's important is because it will um, lead to a, a very substantial increase in the nursing and midwifery workforce, which will in itself help to reduce agency spend. Uh, so, you know, I and there has indeed been a reduction in the agency spend over the course uh, of this year. Uh, um, Christine can say a bit more about that. So we are seeing reductions in agency spend. We've been working with boards very uh, clearly indeed to reduce uh, that uh, that agency spend and we're also increasing the medical workforce through the programs that have been laid out in the medical education package again in this budget 4.2 million pounds being allocated to expand medical education all of that is about building uh, uh, our workforce um, both in nursing uh, midwifery and and medics to ensure that we are not a we're able to not just reduce agency uh, spend but we're also able to uh, mitigate against the, the impact of brexit for example and the uh, the the, uh, the impact that that is likely to have over the next few years so you know in terms of the budget there is a substantial um injection of resource uh, into this area to make sure that we re reduce our reliance on agency spend very, very over time, so I wanted to try and... Well, we could write with a follow-up, if that would be helpful, I was going to suggest that, please do. Uh, you, is that okay, Miles? Yeah. Uh, Brian, on Brexit, very, very, very briefly. Well, I, I appreciate we're short on time, convener, and it's regard, in regards to Brexit, I just wondered um, how the Cabinet Secretary is inputting into the discussions on the implications of health and social care in Scotland, and whether the officials uh, have been or will be involved uh, in those negotiations. What methodology you'll be employing to hear the views of the sectors affected and how you propose to keep this committee uh, updated? Well, um, I mean, Brexit, as I've said here before, is a, a major uh, concern for not just uh, NHS, but uh, care, the care sector as well. Uh, we are uh, inputting into, obviously, Scottish Government discussions, and you'll have um, Mike Russell and I meet regularly in terms of the, the intelligence uh, within the NHS and care services. Uh, meet also regularly with stakeholders in order to get feedback from them directly. So, for example, the BME have done a lot of work around uh, um, their own uh, stakeholders in terms of giving us that information. I met recently with Scottish Care um, and was uh, discussing with uh, Donald McCaskill some of the pressures in the here and now. So he was able to tell me, for example, that uh, the recruitment agencies that operate across Europe that are the recruitment uh, that provide nurses for nursing homes here have essentially closed their doors in Europe because there nobody was coming through the doors and that they are feeling an impact in the here and now in their nursing homes because of that. So, you know, um, there are things happening in the here and now that is not just about looking to the future. And we are looking, so for example, of trialling a programme in Dumfries and Galloway where NHS nurses uh, will provide a locality-based response to the nursing needs of nursing homes. There obviously have to be a contractual element to that, but that is us trying, working with Scottish Care to provide a practical and tangible solution to the fact that nursing homes are not going to be able to recruit nurses uh, for all of the reasons that we, we have set out. So we're very very much involved in those discussions, very much involved in providing the intelligence, but also importantly, very much involved in providing mitigation against uh, what is uh, going to be a, a very, very, very difficult impact for the NHS and our care services. How, how then do you propose to keep the committee? Uh, well, I'm very happy to write to the committee on a regular basis as information um, emerges. It's a fluid situation, as you know, and negotiations are, are very fluid um, and uh, you know we will at times where we have something um, substantial to tell the committee we're I'm happy to, to write okay. to you with that. Okay.
Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks very much for your evidence. Um, obviously, you're staying on for the next session, so we'll suspend briefly to uh, change the panel. Okay.
The uh, second item on our agenda is an evidence session on the review into targets and indicators in health and social care in Scotland. This follows our evidence session on the 5th of December with Sir Harry Burns, who conducted uh, his review. Can I welcome to the committee Sean Robinson, Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health and Sport, Jeff Huggins, Director for Health and Social Care Integration, and Dr Catherine Calderwood, Chief Medical Officer, Scottish Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, who would you like to make your opening statement? Thank you, uh, Convener. I'll, I'll be as, as quick as I can. Um, I welcome the committee's interest in the review of targets and indicators, and I'd like to acknowledge the considerable work by Sir Harry in undertaking the review and the contributions from members of the expert group. Committee members will recognise the importance of our commitment to ensure that we have targets and indicators that are fit for purpose, which reflect our current priorities and which lead to the best outcomes for people. We recognise that much has changed over the last decade in our approach to health and social care. Our vision is of a Scotland where people live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting where services are integrated around the needs of the individual and focused on prevention, early intervention and self-management. Uh, our health and social care delivery plan was published over a year ago and sets out some of the actions for achieving that. It's essential that our targets and indicators are fully aligned with our work to realise that vision. I welcome Sir Harry's report and the principles that it outlines. I know that, like you, we particularly welcome Sir Harry's emphasis on equality of opportunity for everyone in society, enabling people to be resilient and in control of their lives. And I'm pleased that Sir Harry recognises that Scotland has highly challenging targets for public services, which have driven significant improvements in many aspects of health and social care. Within the NHS, Sir Harry recognises that our targets have transformed waiting times for patients and have improved safety. Timely and appropriate access to treatment is important and I've already announced that our current targets such as cancer treatment, a &E, and the treatment time guarantee will uh, remain but Sir Harry was right that we should seek to understand performance across a whole journey of care rather than focus on individual targets or indicators and I'm pleased that he acknowledged the progress of integration authorities in adopting such an approach. This has led to better understanding, for example, of why patients are presenting at A&E in the first place and the provision of alternative community-based services to better meet people's needs. Um, I'm mindful of the demand for emergency care services, which has been un unprecedented over the festive period. We know this is down to a number of factors, including surge and falls and fractures, as well as people presenting with flu-like symptoms. Such exceptional circumstances do mean that some patients stay longer than four hours in our emergency department not simply because of the pressure on the service, but also because that can often be the right clinical setting for assessing their needs and deciding on the most appropriate treatment. Um, NHS boards have responded to this demand to ensure the continued delivery of safe and effective patient care, and we're working very closely with boards to support them through the, the winter. In summary, we agree with Sir Harry that further work on our targets and indicators is required, and we're going to take that forward to create a more balanced approach with a broader-based assessment on the quality of care. That needs to take account people's wider experiences of care, and I'm committed now to take that work forward with COSLA and other partners. I welcome the committee's contribution to that. Okay, thank you very much. Ivan, would you like to begin? Yeah, thanks, convener, and um, welcome back. Um, and I suppose following on from where we kind of left off in the last session, um, when I look at this, this debate within, um, within the health service and reflect on my experience of, um, of running these kind of systems in a previous life, um, I often find that a bit dispiriting that there seems to be kind of two camps set up. There's a kind of outcomes camp and there's the targets camp and they kind of just lob hand grenades at each other. Um, and I think the, the Harry Burns report goes some ways, a lot, it goes some ways towards um, understanding and recognising that frankly all of those things are part of the same thing. You need to know where you want to go to, what, what you're trying to deliver, what your outcomes are going to be, then you need indicators to, to measure whether you're getting there, and then you need targets to assess how you're progressing. And, and those things are, are absolutely um, need to be coordinated together. And people that suggest otherwise frankly don't understand what it is, what it is what we're trying to do here. Um, so I'm glad it's kind of moving in, in, in the right direction. Um, the, the issue then, of course, is that the hard bit um, 
is, uh, is figuring out what you're going to measure because um, it's very easy to come back and say with, with uh, unintended consequences because of X, Y, Z. But frankly, that's because the design of the target system wasn't correct in the first place and you're measuring the wrong stuff. And that's why a lot of thought and a lot of hard work needs to go in at that level. And it's clear from, from the outcome of the report that there's a, a long way to go still to, to, to make sure that 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 uh, that system is uh, is robust. Um, so I suppose that the, the questions I, I, I wanted to kind of touch on were, um, do you recognise that, that at the moment the environment we've got with multiple different indicators all can overlap with each other is cluttered and confusing and needs some clarity? Um, and I suppose the next question is, where do you think we go next in terms of the work that the Harry Burns has done uh, and, and, and where does that go? Yeah, I think the what I would want to see from the next phase of the work is to look at that landscape and to bring more of a coherence to it. So um, if you take um, the a &E target, for example, um, the reason that it is important as a target in itself is not just because of how long people wait in a &E to be seen, treated and discharged. It is used as a bit of a barometer of how the whole hospital uh, is performing. So if you, you know, if, if I was a, a member of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine sitting here, I would be saying that for them it's important um, because it enables all of their colleagues in the whole hospital to take responsibility for what's happening at the front door of the hospital. However, what we've done with the integration authorities, and this is getting into the territory that you're you're talking about here, is actually we've taken a step before that, and the the um, indicators that uh, that the integ integrated authorities are looking at is how do you reduce demand on unscheduled care in the first place to avoid people ending up in a &E who don't need to be in a &E, um, by developing those services uh, uh, locally. So it's about joining the dots on that. Jeff can say a little bit more uh, on this area, but it's been uh, really quite groundbreaking to have you know, the, the, the chief officers and the chief execs of councils as concerned uh, about how do you reduce demand on unscheduled care as a chief exec of the health board for the first time. So they see it as as much mm. their responsibility to reduce that demand on unscheduled care uh, as the NHS does. So that gets us in, think, to the right space. It's then about how do you, how do you make that whole uh, process um, transparent how do you keep the, the 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 importance of what happens at the front door of the hospital but you take the whole journey from what happens in the community uh, through to to someone either being admitted to hospital or discharged from A&E so that's a bit we want to do more work on to really measure the outcomes and 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 how successful we are going to be at keeping people away from the front door of the hospital when they don't need to be there so I think it, the, the work that we've been doing with integration authorities in that area has been really interesting. We're about a year into that. Um, it was about this time last year in the context of the previous spending review that we wrote to integration authorities to set out the six areas where we were looking to for them to set their own objectives and, and to make progress. And I think Sir Harry's review learnt quite a lot from that process because if, if you look at the five of those indicators, or indeed all six of them, they are um, unscheduled care bed days, they are... Um, attendances and for our a and &E performance, they are delayed discharge, they're the availability of palliative and end of life care. And, and, so, you're, and uh, so you're looking within that at a number of different dimensions which are all about the whole journey rather than about particular points on the journey. The, the, the process has been interesting because when we, when we then look at what happened within mm -hmm. local systems and the objective setting, you see probably four different dimensions to what was going on. Um, you know, as, as the committee will know from the evidence we've offered before, most integration authorities have got very different starting positions. So tar targets generally impose a, a level at which everybody must be. And, and our experience with that is for many of the targets, some areas will achieve those targets relatively easily, but other areas will really struggle to achieve the targets where our overall interest is improvement. So you see integration authorities looking at different starting points. Um, you see them having different levels of ambition and that's been quite interesting. Some expect to make more progress over 12 months, others expect to make less. They've got different degrees of capability and support to actually take forward change. 
and some of them also have different understandings as to how the world works. You know, what's the impact of demography over time? And so all of those things come together in how they then present, these are our objectives for the next 12 months. So we've been working with the chief officers so that they can see what each other are doing, you know, to offer a degree of moderation through that process. But in the context of them then using that to think about what their plans would be in place to take forward the change that gives them the improved services as a, at a system level that they're looking to achieve. And I, I think that work is, is a very good trailblazer for the sort of approach that Sahari is looking for in the future, that you look at systems of care and the degree to which they function effectively to produce better quality, uh, but also understand the interactions between different services. Because you know, early in Harry's report, one of the things he identifies with targets is the challenge about how they pull the focus very sharply into one component of the system, at times potentially at the risk of other parts of the system. And his exhortation to us is think more broadly. So, so I think I think the integration work has been very very helpful in that space. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and it's good to hear that. And, and I suppose um, th there was a couple of points out of there. Um, I think you're absolutely right at the systems level. That, that that's obviously where you need to start. And those system level indicators need to be aligned to what your outcome is for the whole the whole the whole health system um but then clearly there's there's a kind of hierarchy below that and i suppose that's a bit the bit that's missing there's a lot of stuff thrown in there but it's not clear how it relates to each other because you'll have a measure for the whole system but individual parts of the system will have their own, their own kind of sub indicators that will feed into that through that hierarchy and, and i suppose the other point is around about targets there's absolutely no reason why you wouldn't have different targets for different um, integration authorities. The important thing is that the framework is the same, and they're measuring the same stuff. But clearly, depending on where they are on the journey, that mm -hmm. they're going to have, uh, they're going to have different targets. So that's uh, that's good to hear. Thanks very much, um, Alex. Thank you. Uh, good morning to the panel. Happy New Year. Um, I think what I was struck when by most when Sir Harry came to talk to the committee was by um, what was not being measured rather than what was being measured. And as we know, the old adage says that what gets measured gets done. And he specifically used a lot of his time to talk about the fact that we need to be collecting more information about adverse childhood experiences because trauma in childhood leads to some of the most negative social outcomes that we have and, and there's a lot of research that. Can I ask what the government's response to that will be and whether it now intends to start collecting that data and then approaching service delivery from a more in trauma-informed response? Yeah, I think there uh, is... Um, well, a lot of importance, obviously, in what Sir Harry says uh, around that area. If you track um, those who have had an adverse uh, childhood experience, have suffered trauma in childhood, and you marry that up with the uh, with the prison population, uh, with uh, offending generally, uh, drug and alcohol dependence, uh, um, and so on and so forth, you know, it is there very, very clearly for all to see. So, if there can be an, an interruption. To that um, uh, through the collective efforts of of services and, and government then that is obviously something that is very very important we've had a number of uh, cross-government discussions about that uh, looking at how for example we can uh, work more closely um, with uh, our early year services um, work more closely uh, with education to find those opportunities um, to to interrupt um, so the work of health visitors of, and obviously the increase in the workforce there is important in this territory, the family nurse partnership, uh, you know, the, the uh, attainment fund within schools, uh, the work that we're doing between um, health and justice to look at how we can get better intelligence of, um, you know, what has happened in people's lives and what would have helped at particular times to, to interrupt that that uh, that cycle so uh, this is something that uh, the whole of government is very um, keen to do uh, I guess what we would want to work out through the the next phase of this is well so what might that look like in terms of it's not an easy thing to measure how, how do you measure uh, what worked in someone's life when that made the difference between a good outcome and a not, not so good outcome. And so we need to put some thought into that. But you know, please be assured that it is, has been recognized as something that we think we can do more about in a more systematic way than we are at the moment. Well, I, I agree the intent is there, absolutely. I, I'm not really talking about 
measuring what worked, although that is a very important part of it. I think we need to get the basics right, and I think that's what um, Sir Harry was talking about, particularly around just capturing, you know, the traumatic life events that children experience, and that's not just the the usual what we would expect as being traumatic life events like bereavement and loss, but also things like attachment disorder and uh, experience of. Um, disruptive homes, abusive homes, the rest of it, because um, the NSPCC produced a report called Right to Recover, which suggested that actually a very small proportion of Scottish local authorities actually have trauma recovery services, dedicated trauma recovery services. And I think what Sir Harry was alluding to is the fact that we aren't getting the business end of this right. So whilst there's a role for health visitors and the Pupil Attainment Fund and the rest of it in terms of mitigating the impacts of childhood trauma, we aren't addressing the absolute uh, the sharpest end of this in terms of trauma recovery and I don't think we'll address that Question. until we start capturing um, capturing those basic statistics so uh, is there a commitment from the Scottish Government to answer that challenge from Sir Harry and start recording those very you know the reasons for that trauma not just what we're hoping to do about it in the future I'm going to make an appeal we need to be really yeah. brief and sharp by both Sorry, answers and questions me. okay yeah, yes, in essence there is. Catherine, do you want to say? So we need to learn, I think, from what they have done in Wales. There was a 2016 study in Wales which looked at adverse childhood experiences. 47% of the Welsh adult population have had one adverse childhood experience and 14% have had four or more. I think when they got those data, they were surprised as a country as to just the, the, the prevalence. So we are going to add into the Scottish Household Survey that you'll be familiar with some questions, and this is in adults initially, on adverse childhood experiences. What we do need to be aware of, and Mark Bellis, who wrote that report in Wales, and I have had discussion about this, that actually some of this revealing of the past experience is actually traumatic for people. And in fact, we need to be very careful about how we phrase the questions and also be prepared for people needing to come forward to have help, even because they're recognising that perhaps the outcome they've ended up with has been because of their childhood and that link has not been made for them before. What we would also want to do is work um, with the ACES hub, which has been set up. So Linda de Castaker, Director of Public Health in Glasgow, chairs that hub. What we're talking with her about is having some form of routine inquiry for every interaction with health and social care. Again, that would need to be done very sensitively, but what we would be doing would be putting in, whether from my point of view there would be a medical history taken, there would also be some inquiry as to the, the, the child's background <coughs> and the potential for adverse childhood experiences. It's much more difficult. For, to, to ask for children who are then in that situation at the time, but obviously extremely important because you can then act and, and prevent. So we need the data. I think you're absolutely right. We don't have that for Scotland. I, I would say it's unlikely to be very different than the Welsh experience. We need the baseline data, so we're intended to collect that, and that we do have this um, ACES hub with a lot of ideas already about how we need to really take forward work in Scotland. Uh, Jenny? Thank you, Convener. Just as a follow-up then to Alex Hamilton's line of questioning with regard to ACEs, um, Harry Burns was quite critical of GERFIC. He said, well-meaning policies such as GERFIC have arrived, but it's time someone came up with a system to create success at school and pulled all of that together. Um, so with regard to that agenda, do you agree that there's a disconnect between health and education at the moment? Could we be doing more? I think we can always be doing more and there have been a, a number of discussions taking place about what that more uh, can be in a more joined up way looking at the um you know the support of uh, um, women before they give birth through to early years through then to school and looking at how we make sure that there is a, a more of a coherence there and opportunities to support families and um, we've done a lot of work in that early years um zone so the work uh, around the expansion of health visitor workforce family nurse partnership trying to support families in those early formative years in order to deal with issues like attachment issues and um, those uh, you know, the, uh, families struggling um at, at that time and really you know the uh, trying to to have a positive impact before the child enters the school environment and then within the school environment trying to pick up 
um, uh, an early stage any issues, but uh, you know there is always more that we can do. And I think um, you know, Catherine uh, and colleagues are looking at how we can you know more closely join the dots across uh, government, particularly between education, health, and, and justice. Yeah. Just on that point, then, um, one of the recommendations from the report is that analysis of school attainment rates should routinely consider the effect of adverse uh, circumstances arising from socio-economic deprivation on attainment. Um, Cabinet Secretary, have, have you had any specific meetings or discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Education on that recommendation, or do you plan to in the future? Yeah, we have had a number of discussions about it, um, and also the whole area of um, how, you know, we've just been talking about how can we um, more closely align the, um, the, uh, the the collective resources that we have to better support uh, those children who need that support in a more systematic way. So we've had a number uh, of discussions uh, around around that and the wider issue. What we need to do, and I think Sir Harry's um, challenge to us provides a, a format for us to look at how we measure that. How do we measure what the impact is of, of the what we're doing at the moment and what new services and new supports that could be developed, uh, what the impact of that would be. Um, Jeff? I, th I think the other thing to recognise is that this is going on in parallel with the work on the National Performance Framework, mm -hmm. which looks across all of government. And so some elements that have appeared in Harry's report are likely to end yeah. up as part of that process yeah. in taking that more, over more overarching approach, whereas some elements from his report will be more about the health and care system. Yeah. So. Um, Brian? Uh, thank you, Gabina. If we can look at the, the role of targets and indicators, and, and, and in this committee we asked uh, several um, in several sessions here um, what was I thought a fairly straightforward question in that who monitors uh, one of the one of the indicators which would be significant adverse events, and um, from my and Arm we got nothing but waffle. Um, and from Jason Leach, his written evidence seems to contradict his oral evidence. And it's really quite simple. It's, it's, we just ask what constitutes a, a significant adverse event, uh, and is it universal across health boards, and, and who monitors them at a government level, and more importantly, the changes, any significant changes within an ad adverse events uh, numbers within a health board. And that's obviously important because if there is a significant change, they've either instigated uh, practices that have that, that should be uh, rolled out across uh, the whole of our, our NHS or they've changed the way that they record them. Um, and, and if nobody government levels were watching that, how can we learn uh, from, from, from these sort of targets? And, and I think what Catherine was saying earlier on um, is that there's work and improvement to be done in that area of creating, uh, first of all, knowing what the figures are um, and trying to get a, a proper analysis and looking at the, what they've done in Wales in terms of what the the impact of the population is, and then to create, a, I guess, a bit of a baseline to be able to then look at, well, how do you interrupt that in an effective way? So I, I take your point. I think there needs to be more coherence. Uh, I think the work emanating out of this and the work we're doing jointly uh, across government um, can set a, a far clearer framework for uh, an ambition, which, you know, it's a, a very ambitious thing to say that you're going to, you know, um, really aim and seek to tackle um, uh, adverse childhood events in a, 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 a systematic way and, and how you do that is very, very difficult indeed. But um, you know, I'm very happy to, uh, once this work is underway um, more fully, to come back to the committee on that specifically to set out how we're going to do that and how we're going to make sure that the monitoring and oversight of that is as robust as it needs to be. Would it, would it be your intention then to, to put that in the public forum? Put the... So the, 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 the sort of the, the, any changes or any uh, measurement of those within the public forum? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got work to do I think, in terms of what we're going to measure, how and baselines and uh, how we're going to take that work forward. So it's at a pretty early stage, but once that has been pulled together into the, the plan, then, yeah, I'm very happy to share that with the committee. Thank you. Okay, Brian. Uh, Colin. Thanks so much, Kevin. Can I just go back to 
Well, I think so the, the crux of the, the whole review, and, and that's really the, the big challenges that we face, the fact that of the, the 16 Western um, European countries mentioned, Scotland's got the lowest life expectancy, the inequality gaps increasing, uh, you know, with affluent Scots living, uh, life expectancy rising, and, and, and those in deprived areas actually falling. But obviously those inequalities are, are complex. And the current thinking uh, on transformational change for wellbeing suggests adopting this whole life course approach across the whole of government um, focusing on social justice, um, growth and wealth. Um, so you effectively have this one system of of indicators on health and wellbeing, but that cuts across every government department. Is the life course approach something that you support? And how, from a practical point of view, do you actually deliver that when we still work very much in silos across departments? Yeah, um, I think there is... Um huge merit in adopting a, a whole life course um, uh, look at uh, the way we what our priorities are how we measure you know, what what those outcomes are in a more systematic way I mean there's been some progress made across government in uh, trying to what you've described as is break down the silos and when you look at well for example the integration uh, agenda I think that shows that we're silos are ge genuinely broken down then there is a responsibility taken that was previously not seen as someone's responsibility to be blunt um, and what we need is to see um the the you know improving the life chances of our next generation our children as everybody's responsibility and to do that in a a joined up um coherent way uh, there is there's been a lot of work done around that i think we need to pull it together uh, more fully and the the, the direction and challenge that, that sir harry has given us i think will provide further impetus uh, for us to do that i think though you identify that it's not an easy thing to do and it can be interrupted by things that sometimes appear out with or can be out with our control so you know without being um putting you know uh, uh, too fine a point on it if um for example the the welfare reform agenda uh, removes the income of a family or reduces the income of a family that then uh, impacts on the the poverty level that that family is facing and therefore all of the things that flow from that that is quite a difficult piece of the jigsaw to then have uh, as part of our plan because it is not something other than mitigating that as far as we can and we have obviously put a lot of work in place to try and do that so you know i think we need to um absolutely look at how we can with all the levers at our disposal do more and better around this but i think we also have to recognize that sometimes um, there are impacts that are uh, out with our control that do have a, a pretty severe impact on household income, um, employment and so on and so forth. I, I think the other thing which is quite um, important from the review is also how Sir Harry widens the scope of the things that we consider when we look around outcomes and indicators. So at the moment we're doing work in Dumfries and Galloway around um, dementia outcomes and indicators based on work that we've done with the International Consortium on Health Outcome Measures. Uh, and and what, what, what they're looking at is being able to measure across systems things like people's sense of control, um, their social connectedness, and those things which are really quite fundamental to broader health and well-being outcomes. But we're finding that to be really quite challenging because those aren't the traditional sorts of things that we've measured, in that we tend to measure things in very particular situations which are time-bounded and which you can put into a spreadsheet quite easily. Whereas at, at this stage, when you're looking in terms of the quality of experience that people have, which also affects the likelihood that they might present at A&E or go to their GP for support. What, what you are beginning to look at is a lot more granularity within local systems to understand how well we're supporting people to, to live the lives that they want to live. And, and that's, that's largely an undeveloped area in our system and indeed in systems across the world. Um, to actually be asking those questions. You know, we've, we've had the conversation on more than one occasion about issues to do with loneliness um, and you know, the degree to which people have good um, social ties and support systems around them. But again, those that aren't part of our measurement system, although those can be as important or more important than individual clinical interventions. And, and that's quite challenging. I think the other element as well is it begins to enable you to step into the space of realistic medicine in a different way. And, and also understand how not doing something might in some occasions produce a better outcome than doing something. 
because at the moment all the things that we measure in our system are where, where something has happened, um, but we don't have a methodology to understand what the impact of something not happening was. Um, and again, once you begin to look at those qualitative factors and be able to bring them into the story, you can understand and perhaps help people more to understand what they might want in terms of other people's experience as well. So, so there's, there's really quite a big challenge around the way in which Sir Harry's opened up the space of, of, of looking at indicators and outcomes beyond the very traditional understanding of how fast or how well a system is operating. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think what we actually will ultimately measure, I think, is, is going to be the, the, the big challenge. Specifically, Sir Harry goes on to, to say when he talks about the life course approach, um, that individuals need support at different key stages, you know, pre-birth, um, early childhood, uh, and he, he argues specifically um, about the fact that the early year support is obviously key. And I'm going back to the point that, that, that Jenny made earlier, is there scope to, to reinvigorate the work of the early years collaborative um, in light of what Sir Harry is saying in, in the report? I think we need to look at all of the, the mechanisms that we can use and the, the levers and, the, and the, the expertise that we have, not just in government and partners, but, you know, uh, with the, uh, the public as well in terms of uh, those who, have, um, who have, have been through many of these experiences directly. So uh, I think there's something in that. I think the Early Years Collaborative and uh, has, has done a lot of very, very good work. I think what we need to do, though, is to take a step back from that, first of all, uh, and to really reassess um, what it is that we want to achieve. So what is the uh, what are the outcomes we want to achieve and how across government we're going to do that and whether or not the mechanisms, the the collaboratives, the the uh, methodology that we have for delivery of that, whether it's fit for purpose or whether we need to do something different. And we're at the stage really of, of looking quite openly, I think, of where we are at and as a with a, a commitment across government to really refocus and re-energise work around this area. So very happy to keep the, the committee informed about that. Um, I've got Sandra and Emma want to come in on this issue, so very briefly. It's, it's about the lifestyle approach, and I think Sir Harry's papers uh, absolutely spot on. It is about <coughs> holistic and collaborative working. But the one I wanted to pick up on, you mentioned yourself, Mr Huggins, about um, loneliness, etc. and that. Are we taking any of the data we get from the deep end practices? Because I think the deep end practices, obviously, which are targeted to the, the most disadvantaged areas in Scotland and the people there, uh, they have shown up some, some issues where people will turn up, older people in particular, and it's just loneliness. It's not necessarily they need any prescription or see a doctor. Is there data being taken from that that we can use, uh, you know, in this lifestyle approach? Well, uh, yes, but also the new GP contract will enable us to get a far richer seam of, of data coming through primary care in terms of what's measured and what we then know about the population served by that GP practice in a way that we've never been able yes. to do so uh, before. And that will help not just the, the GP practice and its partners to look at the services that need to be delivered to that area, but it will help us collectively to look at what the, the needs are of that population. So in terms of a more a, a deep end practice or, a, or services uh, being delivered to uh, more deprived communities, that will be a rich seam of information that will tell us uh, far more than we know at the moment in a more detailed local way. So um, I think that provides us with an opportunity to really drill down uh, and not you know not just look at the, the data, but then to, to formulate uh, service uh, delivery and, and supports around what that data tells us. Just, just, just on that, I think there's, there's perhaps <clears throat> two, 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 two or three things to build on what the Cabinet Secretary has said. The Sir Harry Henry's report suggests also that as part of the work to take forward the review, that we should also be doing things like testing and learning rather than simply arriving at an answer and trying to implement. And a, a lot of what's going on within the system is that testing and, and learning. Um, and, and, and so the, 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 there's a, a clear objective to do that. There is a balance also between, uh, because often our focus is on national indicators or national targets, also the, between, the balance between national and local in terms of the improvement mindset. So there are elements which you might expect to cascade up, but other elements that you would expect to be part of local systems improvement mm -hmm. and their use of data using 
list and source. And I think the, thir the third thing is to come back to the Cabinet Secretary's point about being really clear about framing an overall aim to the system, then setting the outcomes, and then working through the indicators. Uh, and actually, so having a, a you know a progression, and you know that's the way in which we took forward the work on uh, the dementia outcomes, which ended up with us having outcomes for which initially we didn't have indicators, and we had to actually build the indicators to actually support what we were trying to achieve, <coughs> rather than the other way around, which is often the case. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Harry Burns uses the word flourishing in his report because we want to create a healthy flourishing population and it's actually quite nice to hear that you've mentioned Dumfries and Galloway a lot this morning because I'm aware of some of the programmes that are being implemented to help look at health and social care integration and best way forward for keeping folks out of hospital so I'm wondering what resources or incentives are available for local authorities to help them engage in PDSA cycles or change cycles or whatever methodology they choose to use so that we can encourage the you know, the flourishing population that we're, we're seeking. You know, about the improvement uh, work and support to... Yeah, so, so the, work, the work that we're doing at the moment in Dumfries and Galloway in respect of the, the dementia activity is being supported by the, the team at his who support dementia more generally. So they, they're, they're embedding that in part of the, the broader change work. Um, IHUB at Healthcare Improvement Scotland is also providing support across the country to... Um, integration authorities around things such as falls, um, work on admissions, um, work on delay. They're also supporting some of the work on sleepovers at the moment. Um, but it's in the context that local systems are looking to make change and, and own that change locally, um, but require at times some support to be able to, to give effect, whether that's technical or data or analytical. So it's a, it's a balance between the national and local. Our, our objective is um, primarily that local systems own and want the changes which are the positive changes um, and find the local solutions that can take that forward and Dumfries and Galloway is a good example of that. And obviously some boards, I'll be really quick, some boards are a bit further ahead with change programmes than others so obviously boards will learn from each other what works in one area and how it can be adapted for another. Yeah, I mean we, we do that through um, all the improvement programmes, we try to get best practice uh, and uh, share it. I mean, obviously, you, what might work in the centre of Glasgow might be a bit different from a rural area, given the different resources that uh, can be called upon um, in those circumstances. But, uh, but you know, if something works well, then we would want to, to share that and help services to, to develop that in their own area. OK, okay. Miles. Uh, thank you, Convener. I wanted to... Um, discuss the area around NHS staff empowerment and one of the areas which I was quite keen and I raised this as with Harry Burns was around professional responsibility and in terms of targets we often set NHS and social care staff so I was just interested to find out from the panel your view of how we could change that because I'm sure I'm, I'm not the only MSP around this table who meet nurses who are telling us that they're often asked to record information they don't think is useful so it's actually giving them empowerment to actually do their job. So I was wondering what the panel's view was on, on how that needs to change. Well, I'll bring Catherine in, in a second. I think you know, my, my uh, instinct uh, is that we, we do need to listen to, to frontline staff uh, more around what they think we sometimes get them spending time doing in terms of, you know... Um, uh, recording things and you know all of which takes time so we need to make sure when we're asking people to to record things you know, we, we're pretty clear about what the importance of that is and why and that that staff are are fully uh, bought into that if you like and feel that you know what they're doing is a there's a reason and a purpose to it so you know in in shooting the engagement of uh, our frontline staff and all of this is very very important and I, I also hear from, from doctors about why are you looking at that indicator? That means nothing to me clinically. That isn't going to be the sort of thing that's going to improve patient outcomes. Why are we measuring it at all? So the, uh, our involvement of the clinical staff with the expertise, it's perhaps not traditionally felt that, that that's something that people want to do. They want to see patients. They want to, to be at, at work. And I think we need to make those roles much more attractive. So actually, in, in, you will have more potentially more impact in clinically advising about co 
really worthwhile indicators and targets than doing an extra clinic. And we, we don't necessarily value that work that, that is looking at a national level. I would also say that what we must be careful is about proportion and, and the burden of data collection for actual results. When I um, was part of a big maternity audit, I calculated how much time each keystroke took and worked out that we could have employed 50 more midwives a year in the time it was taking the whole country to, to record. And, and I'm not sure we look at that very well either. We, we, we keep saying collect more data, collect more data, and actually that needs to be proportionate to the, the, the actual improvement it will create. And another component to that, though, is um, if we think about our experience of the work on dementia diagnosis rates, that, that began back in 2008, um, that part of the challenge around that was there was a degree of opposition uh, from general practitioners and others to the idea that we should be doing it at all. Um, and the, you know, the process that we built around that was to be quite clear about the benefits, but also to be quite clear that patient and carer voices were heard as part of the story in terms of what mattered to them. And, and how diagnosis was part of a process of enabling them to move forward with their life um, and wasn't seen in the way that some doctors presented it would be. So often it's about bringing the, putting what we're trying to do in, in context. I think there's two other components to it though which are also interesting. One is generally where people get feedback and feel a benefit from the information that they provide, they're more likely to provide information. And so our systems around ensuring that people see the value, but also the contextual use that the, the data is. And, and I guess the, the, the link to that is the work on the digital strategy, where the objective is to automate more of the collection of data so that it doesn't require either manual entry or um, additional work, you know, which could be done by machines. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's three elements. But I think the, 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 the most important within that is ensuring that the value um, can be ascribed back to the value that it has to patients and carers. And the more that data is real-time data, the better, rather than us looking back at what happened a year ago. Um, yeah, I can see. Okay, okay. Ash. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in terms of the existing targets that we have, the, the only one that re the review was suggesting that could potentially be removed is the 18-week referral to treatment target. And the suggestion behind that was that there was possible unintended consequences around interfering with clinical decision making and maybe even patient decision making as well. So do you think there's still merit in, in keeping that target or are there better indicators we could potentially use to get us the information we need without um, the in unintended consequences? So what I would want to do is to take that and to interrogate it and look at it in more detail and um, to look at what, because I, I think Harry makes a, a, a good point. Um, but we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think there is the next phase of work. We would want to take that and look at whether um, there is a, a better way of, of measuring, uh, essentially, uh, and not and not over, you know, because I think Harry's point is that, you know, by and large, we already measure that part of the patient journey. So is it just a, a, a re-measurement in a different way of the same patient journey? So... Uh, so we want to take that recommendation and look at it in the next phase of work and see uh, what uh, uh, what transpires from, from a, a closer look at his recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask in general about the, the review? Um, you know, the review took a long time and it was delayed and it seemed a wee bit underwhelming when it came out. And, and, uh, were you expecting more from this or was this what you expected back? Well, I mean, we tasked Harry with a big job to do, and of course, he, his review is in two parts. One was on the, you know, more focused on the, the the targets and indicators, and the other was more on the, the uh, the, the the kind of whole um, area of of health inequality and how we uh, make huge changes. So he, he undertook. An enormous task. Maybe the task was too enormous in terms of the the remit. But we, but you know what Harry's like. Once he gets going, he he wants to to have the the freedom to look at um, all of those areas. And I think what has transpired from it is is a signal in in a particular direction that then is for us to take 
and build on the detail of which. So, um, you know, I, again, I want to thank him for his work. I think he is a, a great asset to us. He's able to put his uh, enormous experience uh, to work in a way that, you know, gives us a... It might not dot every I and cross every T, but it does give us a direction of travel. It's now our job to take that and to, to apply the detail um, going forward. One of the things that, that the current system allows you to do and us to do is, is look across the UK at comparators. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, at the moment we could see that Scotland's, um, you know, the figures, I think it was to November, that Scotland's A&E figures were 94.4 for the four hour and, and England was 84.9. And urgent referrals, um, uh, cancer referrals, Scotland was 86, England was 82. But if we look at some of the other indicators, for example, referral to treatment time, which is one of the key ones that Harry wants to get rid of, um, we were 7.7% lower than in England. If we look at diagnostic tests within uh, six weeks, we are 17% lower. And for things like colonoscopy, Scotland was within six weeks. Scotland was sitting at 58% and England was 93%. So we can see significant differences between mm -hmm. ourselves, England, Wales and, and, mm -hmm. and Northern Ireland with the current system. If mm -hmm. we change and they don't, how do we then have comparators to hold you to account and yeah. for you to make political points <laughs> about what's happening elsewhere? Well, I mean, I think you made an important point and, you know, they are the most comparable health systems. Although what I would caveat that with is that quite often when you look behind the data, there are quite variations in the way data is collected. So we're not always measuring apples against apples. It's sometimes apples and pears, but it doesn't always seem like that. So uh, I think you, you make an important point. That's why we have to proceed carefully, because it is helpful for us to benchmark, not just the across these islands, but actually benchmark elsewhere. Uh, but you have to be measuring things more or less in the same way to do that in a, a way that is meaningful. And quite often, that's not uh, the case. So uh, taking this forward, I'm, I'm going to be very cognizant of that because we don't want to lose our comparators, even where they are challenges to us, where we need to make more progress. Um, uh, and that, you know, so you know, be assured we're not going to to throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater here. We want to maintain an ability to, to compare and measure in the right way. Uh, but we also need a more sophisticated system that has more of a focus on, well, what was the patient outcome in all of that? Because often our, the, what we measure doesn't give us that bit of the picture. And that actually is, is really important. And you know that's the bit that we want to, to focus on. Could I, could I ask a couple of things, maybe just so you can help in winding up, uh, Jeff, is, um, in relation to the time scale for things yeah. moving on and what happens next? So what happens next is the process to take this work forward. Jeff can give you the, the detail on that uh, and a bit on the, the time frame as well. Jeff, do you want to say what the, the thinking is? Yeah, and, and just to pick up the, pre the previous point first, uh, I think I think the issue with that is whether or not 18-week RTT was a target or not, the data would still be there. Um, and so the question is, you know, if, if you think that Harry draws the distinction within the report between information which is available for accountability of the system and information which is there for improvement, mm -hmm. you would still be able to make the comparison whether or not it was a target. Yeah. And, and that, that in a number of the areas where we're making cross-UK comparisons, the information in the other systems, particularly in Wales, isn't a target. It's just information. Uh, and so, so you wouldn't lose, lose that ability. Uh, on, on the process going forward, there are three or four elements to it. F first of all, we are doing some of the local testing work in terms of the use of outcomes, such as the work in Dumfries and Galloway, to actually understand how this would actually work within the system, using indicators and outcomes for improvement rather than simple targets applied to NHS boards. Because our, our take on this is that that process of implementation is likely to be more challenging than the process of reaching agreement on what the indicators should be. Um, and we need to have those two things aligned in terms of how we take the, the change forward. Um, we are working to develop a next stage process because, you know, as you reflected in respect of Harry's review, um, what we saw was people with very strong views as to whether things were good or bad and what the answer should be. And, and what we think we need is a more sophisticated process to enable us to make decisions uh, as we crunch through the high-level aim to the outcome to the indicator, learning from organisations and bodies that have done that previously. So we're, we will build a process, but we'll do that in parallel with the testing work. 
Um, we also want to build in the learning that we've taken from the integration authorities in, in, in terms of their experience of working in that different way during the, the first 12 months. And I think the other key component, and it comes back to the digital strategy, is the degree to which the information systems that we'll be building under the digital strategy um, make the collection of appropriate data, both for improvement and accountability, routine rather than an add-on that's applied to the system. So that's the, the process. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a long session this morning. We thank you very much for coming along. Um, just before we move into private session, this is likely to be my last uh, time convening the committee, so I would like to put on the record my thanks to all of the staff who have helped me over the last two years and all the committee members uh, for their work. I uh, just want to put that on the record before we move, now move into private session. Thank you.